Seeing a presence of a quorum, call the meeting of the Amherst School Committee uh, to order at 6.03 p.m. Um, just a reminder that this meeting is recorded um, and not being live broadcast tonight. Is that correct? Not being live broadcast, but it is being recorded and will be made available for um, viewing afterwards. So um, welcome, everybody. The uh, first item on our agenda is uh, to approve the minutes of September 25th. So I'll uh, give the committee a moment to review the minutes. Do you have any edits or comments? Mr. Dumling? I, I just want to note for uh, general purposes that um, we always get these minutes ahead of time in electronic form, so we have the weekend to take them out. I always used to wonder as I watched these meetings why the minute approval went so quick. That's <laughs> Primarily because of that. <laughs> Excellent point. That's so right. That's right. For public edification. Miss Westmoreland does a fantastic job of making yes. sure we get our materials ahead of time so we can review these uh, efficiently and effectively. Okay, so I will take a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move to approve the minutes of um, September 25th, 2018. Great. And a second? A second. Thank you. All those in favor? Excellent. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. The meeting <coughs> minutes are approved for September 25th. I should also just make a note that uh, Mr. Nakajima will not be in attendance tonight. Um, he is uh, traveling. We're in the process of about to start traveling, so he sends his uh, regrets. Okay, so uh, the next uh, item on the agenda is announcements. Does the committee have any announcements tonight? Mr. Demling? Um, so an opportunity for both school committee and public ad advocacy. There is a, um, a free uh, workshop uh, that the Mass Association of School Committees is offering on Sunday, uh, October 27th in Northampton at the Collaborative. Um, if you're watching this at home and you'd like any more information, you can just go to masc.org and the event will be listed there if you're seeing this prior to October 27th. Uh, it's called The Future of Public Education in the Connecticut Valley. And I won't read the whole blurb, but it's essentially about advocacy for state funding of education, charter schools, um, so a lot of the things we've talked about at the committee, and it's open not only to school committee members, but the public. And, um, you know, I mention that not just because those issues are always vital to us, but, um, you know, personally, when I, when I engage in advocacy, um, it often happens most intensely after um, really despairing or bad news at the national or international level, and... I probably don't have to remind you of, of uh, which Supreme Court and which climate change reports have come out this week that have been some pretty terrible news on that front. Um, so uh, I always sort of focus back into it's about voting and it's about organizing. And this is a perfect way for the public to organize. So if you're at home thinking about how do I get involved, this is a great opportunity, very local. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Dumming. It is a great opportunity. Um, and I hope to see our committee members there, Mr. And Dr. Morris. I think it's, is it Saturday the 27th? Oh, did I say Sunday? Yeah. Saturday, October 27th. Sorry, I just yep. wanted to make sure that Thank was you. clear. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Any other announcements from the committee? Okay. Uh, with that, we will move to public comments. Um, a reminder, if anyone has public comment, to please come up to the mic, state your name, and you have three minutes. Thank you, Jean Fay, President of the Amherst Pelham Education Association, and I wanted to extend thank yous to the school committee for looking at the infrastructure issues that we're facing. The staff are very appreciative. Um, this is an ongoing conversation. As you know, these aren't quick fixes. Um, as recent as last Friday, I was notified by Wildwood staff that they're continuing to find fresh rodent droppings in areas where students and staff are frequently. Um, at Crocker Farm, which is the building where I work, this afternoon uh, in the computer lab, um, very wet area in the ceiling tile, directly over computer equipment, which leads to um, another issue when we have infrastructure issues and they're not taken care of, then we're looking at perhaps more expensive issues down the road when equipment gets damaged. So um, again, thank you, um, and I'm, I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Any other public comments?
Okay, seeing no other public comments, we closing public comments. And moving on to the next item on our agenda. We're just zipping along tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, there you go. You did it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Just, you can't help it. Can't help it. Okay. Um, so moving into the superintendent's update, Dr. Morris. Sure. So um, I'm going to start with the Amherst Media, which is not on the page. So I want to thank Amherst Media and their patients. Um, so there's been two or three meetings in the last month between our um, information system staff and Amherst Media information system staff to try to resolve the issues that we've been having. And um, so we, the district, purchased a new, I believe, mixing board. I'm looking at the Amherst Media staff member to make sure I have the term right, but I think that is correct. Mm -hmm. It's not my area of expertise, um, which will hopefully resolve some of the troubles. So we're now in the basically the way, uh, process of rebuilding the infrastructure that we had to help with that. Um, so we have mics, so we're not, we're still using that camera because we haven't linked all the sound and all the cameras, but we're making, we're kind of rebuilding the system essentially so that this can be um, better or restored to um, working, improved work in the future and the live feed and all that. So thanks thank to you. Amherst Media and our IS staff for working on that. Um, also want to thank Amherst Media for just three other things and then I'll I'll, I'll go on to the, what's on the page. So um, some Amherst Media staff, including an intern who uh, is a high school student um, and was my student at Crocker Farm, so I feel very personally. It wasn't my student, I was the principal, but I still feel very personally connected with, at the first day on the common filming. And so they're still in the, they're really working on mixing that um, video to make it, you know, because they have a lot of live video, but it was a long event with a lot of things going on. So in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll, have, um, we'll have that to share with the community. Um, we did a taping last week for the principal and assistant principal of Wildwood, um, so Ms. Estes and Mr. Yaffe, which uh, I think will be, people will really enjoy watching, getting a taste of Wildwood, and also um, what really helped is their, their interactions flowed into the video. It didn't feel sometimes, you know, I send questions in advance, but that always, there's it's a, it's a push-pull on whether that's effective or not, but they did wonderfully. And the next video that will be shot, we're still working on the scheduling, but I think it'll be this month, is on the elementary garden program. So Jen Reese, who's our elementary garden and science coordinator, and Farmer Leela, who is both a local farmer and then supports that program, will come and um, that'll be on Amherst Media later. Well, the filming will be later this month. So thanks to Amherst Media for all that you do. Um, I just want to take a please. moment, Dr. Morris, to acknowledge um, how incredibly valuable I think these uh, these sessions are. We've heard from various community members in the past academic year or so yeah. uh, who have tuned in or have seen the links to the various videos that Amherst Media posts of these sessions. Um, people, you know, suddenly becoming aware for almost sometimes for the very first time of who some of the staff are and some of the programs that we have in the district. Uh, so I just wanted to extend, you know, my thanks for that because I do think it is an incredibly valuable resource and we're able to use Amherst Media uh, in a unique way, you know, I guess maybe not so unique way, but because most people are coming to it through social media, it, you know, becomes sort of a new way of, of, of seeing that. Thank you very much. Um, and I really enjoy it too. It's actually really nice to get to stop and talk to people about their craft that's not typically in a, the average day it's not like oh how are things going and we have half an hour to, to riff on things at Wildwood that's not you know while I work closely with Mr. Yaffe and Ms. Estes it's not our, our norm to stop what we're doing for half an hour and chat and but I think that's much more it's it comes out much more in terms of what the community um, can gather and understand and and kind of learn about so thank you. So um, just a couple things that C our CPAC, Special Ed Parent Advisory Council, is hosting a basic rights in special education workshop um, October 22nd, which is Monday, unfortunately, for us. That's when, if any of us wanted to be here, we have an Amherst School Committee meeting that night from 6 to 8 in um, High School Library, which I'm just now wondering about a space <laughs> conflict. <laughs> so we will work on that. Um, we will work on that. Um, but it's something that's done every... Um, roughly annually, mm -hmm. um, and so for some families it's good to have the fresher, for other families, um, it, we, our families change all the time, right, not just because of transiency, but some, some students graduate and some students join us, and we're just very fortunate to have the CPAC that supports that work um, in the way that they do. I was able to attend the first mm, half hour of the last CPAC meeting, um, Mr. Dumbling was there as well uh, from, from the Amherst side, and just how fortunate we are to continue to um, have long agenda meetings where we're functionally, you know, uh, creating a better environment for our students. It's, it it's doesn't happen everywhere, so we're very lucky. 
open houses. So at this point, all of the open houses at the elementary level have happened, um, and this is the first year where all of them were student-led. Um, so we're still waiting for final attendance, but the rough numbers I got is that over 80% of our students and families attended, which is a significantly higher number than in the past. Uh, created some parking problems and snafus that we will work out in the future. But, um, uh, but you know, just huge success, and many thanks to the principals and the staff particularly at the two schools that it was new to, to jumping right in and, and embracing what it would, how it would be different to have students facilitating the meeting instead of the more traditional open house. Um, but you know, our two goals were increasing attendance and making further, deeper connections with families and communities, and I think on both of those ends, uh, all three events were highly successful, um, despite the backup on Strong Street when people were trying to get to Wildwood, <laughs> things like that. But you know, these are problems that we will be able to work out Good in the future. Yeah, yeah, and they're much preferable than park anywhere you want kind of situations. Um, strategic planning update, I think, uh, as we talked about the last meeting, uh, in future meetings, once we get through some of the agenda items we have on tap the next meeting or two, we'd like to go a little deeper, particularly into the ones at Wildwood and at Quacker Farm and that strategic planning effort. And I put in just an example um, that we're doing broad stakeholder input. At Wildwood, there was like a quick exit ticket um, from the, even from the open house so people could share some thoughts and uh, Nick has been working with the PGO about how do we include more um, stakeholder feedback at the beginning of the process or not quite the beginning but you know early on in the process so they're dedicating time at the next PGO meeting to gather that feedback and input that's just one slice of it, but I thought it was just worth noting and then if there's Wildwood parents in attendance we could also plug their meeting which is next Monday the 15th from 6 to 7. Um, so thank you, Nick, and uh, again, a lot more to come uh, very soon on that. Um, and we, you know, meetings flip-flop and, and we, um, in terms of timing, but for the last two weeks, uh, we, and so that we includes myself, I went to all of them, but uh, Mari Reyes, who's a uh, teacher at Fort River, Julie Mar Ramos, who's a teacher at Fort River, um, Diane Chamberlain, who's here the principal, Katie Richardson, real coordinator, some combination of us. Uh, went to the five preschools that we spoke about when we presented the communication plan as well as hosted, um, Diane hosted the Fort River coffee with the principal with the PGO. And it was great to get that feedback. Uh, we developed a list of FAQs because we were getting some unique questions, but a lot of the questions were similar. So it's, um, it's long because, you know, between the translations, it's six pages. It's on our website now, but we also emailed it out. There's 60 families who uh, wanted to be on a listserv just to get regular updates. So they've gotten a couple already. And for instance, the presentations that are being presented tonight will be emailed to them tomorrow morning. It'll be on our website and things, but we, these are parents uh, and guardians who wanted to have kind of more active participation. Uh, there was a parent meeting that you know we'll talk about in a little bit that um, Diane and Katie uh, and some others facilitated at Fort River just to continue to have even smaller group meetings for parents, to, parents, guardians to be involved. So it was, to me, it was highly successful that we, we talked to families who had been following this closely and knew an awful lot about the, the exploration. And then we also talked to families who this was their first experience hearing that this thing existed. We were just there. We were there either because it was a Head Start's open house or at drop off. And they're like, who are these random people in suits or this guy in a suit? Right. And, and especially in preschool environments, it stands out pretty heavily. So, um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was helpful to finally figure out a way to get at the demographic that sometimes has been, you know, more challenging for us to approach. And I think being present particularly at times where the preschool directors have shared this is, the, this is a good time was really helpful. And it ranged, you know, at Crocker Farm, for instance, there was more questions about inclusion of students with special needs. And what does that look like, given the demographics of their preschool? At Head Start, there were more, there was significantly higher number of uh, either monolingual Spanish speakers or bilingual families who had um, a different set of questions than some of the other who were more likely to have monolingual English speakers. But all in all, we're just really pleased with the turnout and um, the questions and then the enthusiasm we were that we experienced. And finally, on this, the four boards meeting is just a reminder that next Thursday at 5 p.m. is a four boards meeting at Town Hall. Um, so this is, for those of you who, <coughs> or for the public, it's an opportunity where the four boards, which is the Library Board of Trustees, I think, I always get that name wrong, um, the School Committee, the Finance, Com Finance Committee, and the Select Board hear from the Town Manager and Town Staff, State of Town finances, looking forward to FY20, which is hard to say, seems kind of strange, but uh, what does that look like? And there'll be an update also on some of the capital pieces. Um, so uh, I know not everyone's able to make it. I know some of you have gotten in touch with me about travel plans, but just um, it'll be an important meeting to get the lay of the land, um, and then I can share anything with any members who are present. 
Any questions for the superintendent following the update? Um, yeah, so just a couple quick comments. Um, uh, you may not have updates about these things, but I just wanted to make sure that sure. as we do um, the Amherst meetings, since these things are mostly regional, um, so there's the, the 6 to 12 building feasibility about potentially moving, is it feasible to move 6th grade to the middle school? And then there's the math curriculum review, which is 6 to 12. Mm -hmm. So these things just barely one grade hit here, but for the families that it hits, it, it obviously affects them. So um, just keep on your radar. If, the, if you have updates for the region, that those, you know, keep those here as well. Um, and the st strategic planning update, I guess I was curious about the naming. Because um, as I've been talking about it, I, I think of this as like the school identity yeah. effort. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to confuse what is already an ambiguous process at the region, which is also called strategic planning. So um, I, don't, I didn't know if that was intentional or, or maybe, I know, you know, once people, people get a label stuck in their head, it's like mm -hmm. there. And so mm -hmm. yeah, no, at the very beginning, maybe an opportunity to differentiate. Yeah, so I'll think of the nomenclature. I think that's good. I mean, I think I was connecting it, but I think you're right to, to call out the distinctions. Um, the other two, I mean, on the 6 through 12 and the math curriculum review, both of those um, will have more updates. You know, we're getting, you know, those both have financial aspects that have to do through RFPs. So I think in the next two weeks, we should have more information we can share publicly. Maybe three weeks. But yeah, coming soon. Any other questions for Superintendent? Okay, I just have one comment. Uh, the four boards meeting, I won't be attending, and I've communicated with you, uh, Dr. Morris, previously, but I think um, what I might do is maybe just, if it's okay with you, share some thoughts beforehand. Yeah, please do. And we've talked about it a little bit before, so I think you know pretty much where I stand, but maybe just to make it a little more formal. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's good queuing for I'm them. planning on attending the four boards you will, meeting great. as well. Did okay. you say you're not? I will not. You will not Yeah, I will not. So um, I was kind of curious, so this will be my first time attending, if we'll get any materials ahead of time for that meeting. I will check with the town manager on that. I think it's varied. It, okay. has, it has varied. Okay. Um, it's a pretty long in the past. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Morris. If, if, if it's similar to in the past, it's a pretty lengthy slide deck as okay. well. So um, with uh, heavy-duty financial slides and charts and things like that. So... Um, I, I will see if it's possible to be shared with you in advance. Mr. Dunley? Yeah, I think last time we got that slide deck like within an hour of the meeting. <coughs> so okay. Because <it> <laughs> I, I think it's news it that, it uh, some, some of it is news that people are waiting on. Yeah. Right? So it's, I, I think that's probably part of the thinking. Um, do, do we need to have a quorum? So I will, I will be there, but do, do we need to have a quorum? Um, I, uh, typically, I mean, what they, what they end up doing is when, when there is a quorum of the, part, of the different committees, they will call those meetings to order. So we will post the meeting as a school, an Amherst School Committee meeting, and I believe as well, just an Amherst School Committee. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, if there's no quorum, then it's just members in attendance. But, okay. Yeah. I'll be there too. Maybe it's I think I'm opportunity to wear our new there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point. Yes. Nice. yes. So played. And there is, just to clarify, I think even when they have, the town has not gotten the decks to participants in advance, they do a pretty good job of, of reviewing all of the material and all the details and allowing time for questions. Um, but yeah, I think that is a challenge. Okay. Yeah. okay. And just maybe worth mm -hmm. saying that, and I can answer any questions, that's good. Mr. Donas, but um, it's, it's a presentation made to the four boards, and there's time for a conversation and questions, but it's it's a little different than a, I mean, we post a school community because it's possible that dialogue will come up that would trip an open right. meeting law piece, but um, we are not the facilitators of the meeting. Okay. okay. Um, so... With that, uh, the next item on the agenda is new and continuing business, dual language, exploration, and planning. I want to ask Ms. Chamberlain and Ms. Richardson, would you prefer to sit down and present from up here? Or you okay, so I'm going to slide over. Yeah, we're going to join you because we live in one of the backs. Excellent. Okay. That's okay. Thank you. We have a big table here, so <laughs> grab a seat. And thank you so much, both of you, for coming back again. Sure. You're bumping over one mic, or yeah. Okay. Thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. So, um, 
I'm not going to belabor the introduction because I think you'll, you'll get a lot more out of talking, hearing, excuse me, from Ms. Richardson, Ms. Chamberlain, and you will from me on this. But I do want to just uh, contextualize the work a little bit, which is a tremendous amount of work's been done. Um, I think I shared at, at a prior meeting that um, when Mabe came and did last, they worked on the last number retreat, they created all these Google Docs that we were supposed to continue. And, and frankly, they say until they come back to visit a district, they often, the Google Docs stay unchanged. Um, but they can see our progress because they have access and they were just amazed at how much every time they looked, there was more and more and more work that was done and more decisions being made. And so I think we're at the place, as I think I've previewed in the past, that uh, we're not at the firm decision. So you'll see, for instance, a schedule, and it'll be described that this is a draft schedule and there's still lots of open <coughs> questions that we want to sort out. But I think what you hear tonight is the process that has been gone, that has taken place, where we are in that process, and what are next steps. So I want to just frame that this, the work, there'll be some things that decisions have made, but much of the work of the academic program is in draft form because we're really developing and what our goal was to share enough with you uh, and the public this month so that we can gather more and more feedback before final decisions get made. But it's kind of an academic program that's for something that's we're hoping starts 10 and a half months from now. Um, so we've made a lot of progress, but I want to just emphasize the word draft on, on a lot of the work, not because we don't think it's been thoughtful and meaningful, but we still haven't gone through the iterative process that we would go to through any academic program that we were proposing. So all that said, I'm going to turn the mic over to Ms. Chamberlain and Ms. Richardson. Should pick you up from there. You. Okay. The other thing I just want to add on to what Mike is saying is the learning process for us, I think, has been really phenomenal. Every time we do open it up for comments from families or from staff members, it's uh, the perspective grows and it's been really, really helpful mm -hmm. as far as us learning as leaders and making sure that um, other perspectives that are outside our building are really listened to. It's, it's, it's fantastic. So I appreciate all of you that have been showing up and contributing and it's been really wonderful to learn together. So I know that you folks know a lot of this, but I think it's worth reiterating for people at home who may not be as close to it, but the process really started um, quite a while ago through the enrollment working group that Mike started to look at our population and how we were going to take care of all of our students district-wide. Um, so there was a report that was generated that was shared with the, with the community last spring, and there was um, a strong recommendation that we look at a dual language program, which kind of started all of this research. Um, and visits happened pretty quickly, and Katie's been on a few of those visits. Um, and so have a number of representatives from the district, as well as some community members. Uh, we've had a great partnership with the Multi-State multi Association mm -hmm. for Bilingual Association, which is referenced to here as MABE, which is what their, their acronym is. Phyllis Hardy has been a wonderful guide, and as well as two associates of hers that have come and left, led the La Siembra for us, um, and have just been pretty consistently reached on the phone and by email. They're a wonderful resource for us and have been really, really helpful in getting us off the ground and will continue to offer us support. Um, and Phyllis actually came to Amherst to do some forums both with the community as well as our school staff. Um, we've been working really hard to make sure there's ongoing communication with the committee as well as the public for through a number of resources. Um, multiple meetings have been held with staff meetings. Oh, with staff at our school, we continue to work with a leadership team at Fort River, have another meeting tomorrow, um, and there will be an opportunity to grow that group as well. Um, the CPAC has hosted an, a dual language programming event and they continue to be at the table with us and we have um, conversations. Uh, the communication plan was here, was it just two weeks ago? Short, not too long ago. Um, and as Mike said before, our preschool visits have been ongoing and, and probably will be again in the spring. So one of the things that our leadership team worked really hard on based on the work we did in Los Amber was a mission statement. And I know you folks have had a chance to read this and forgive me, but I am going to read it for the sake of Please. folks at home. Um, and one of the things we've already learned is that it's time for Spanish to be first. So we will be flipping this in soon, soon, soon uh, in, in short order if, if things do move forward. Um, but for now, the Fort River, du Fort River Dual Language Program celebrates and integrates the cultures of all of our students, families, and staff. The Dual Language Program appreciates, nurtures, and challenges all of our individual students to reach their fullest potential as learners and global citizens. The dual language program promotes equity by developing bilingual and biliterate students prepared for economic and social leadership in our community and world. And that's something I think all of us are deeply committed to. 
Um, it was really important when we developed a mission statement that it could stand alone, but also that it was um, in conjunction with the mission statement of Fort River. And I won't read that one specifically. It's in our Fort River handbook, and it is posted on our website. Um, but there definitely is some overlap, thinking about the whole child, thinking about cultural competencies, thinking about equity, and really thinking about um, all aspects of how you can tr contribute to the community once your schooling in Amherst is over, preparing yourself for lifelong learning. So one of the things we have to think about as a school and a school district is transitioning from a monolingual mindset, which we, many of us have been entrenched in for a long time, um, to that multilingual mindset um, and not thinking that speaking two languages or more than one language is good for some students, but really that is good for any and all students. Um, that students don't use both languages because they're confused, but because having groundings in two languages actually is a really wonderful thing and can, can give tools and resources to students that they might not have if they're forced to think in that monolingual mindset. Um, and understanding that there may not be a specifically dominant language, that there's, they're developing two languages simultaneously, um, and that it doesn't fit that traditional mold of being dominant in one or the other. We want them to be um, partners, really. And we, we expect that with that, students might not fit the mold that we've been seeing before, that they don't learn like monolingual students. There really is a specific profile for students that are learning bilingually. Um, and it was great, one of our last parent sessions, actually family sessions, it was pointed out to us that we had been talking about delayed acquisition of language. And we really needed to shift our mindset as well, that it's not a delayed acquisition. It's right on track if you're learning two languages at the same time. Mm -hmm. You might not be meeting the state benchmarks as um, the state puts them forward, but because the state puts it forward in a very monolinguistic way. Um, so we have to think about our, our um, learning targets a little bit differently as well. Um, and that having bilingual students is an asset to all of us, both the culture of the entire school, our entire community. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Can please. Just one thing? Mm -hmm. So I think it'll, it'll pick me up. Um, <laughs> so I think the other thing, and I know I've said this before, but I want to say it again, is um, you know, over half the world's children grow up in a multilingual environment. So mm -hmm. it's just it's sort of unusual in mm -hmm. our neck of the woods, so to speak. And by that, I don't mean Amherst and I don't think Massachusetts. I mean kind of right. North America mm -hmm. in particular. Um, but over half the world's children grow up in a month. So sometimes when, when I heard that, it really helped me with that mindset mm -hmm. piece because it's unique because of the environment and the conditions that we've set up in the United States where it's unusual. If you look at the world, kids of all around the world are growing up in this. So it's, it's, it's a condition we've created. It's not necessarily the condition that's the norm. Uh, across the world. Sorry, that's I wanted right. to. And, sure, and that's true point. for all of our English learners, right? Every day, mm -hmm. regardless of their program mm -hmm. model. So it's something that we've been thinking a lot about across the district, but that this really helps further that conversation and deepen it. So. And we know that this work is going to target a population that we have not been meeting the needs of historically. So this is um, overdue. Um, so, so thinking about school-wide integration of the language and the culture is in a vital aspect of things as well. So Fort River will look a little bit different, right? We expect to have signage throughout the building. Um, we do hear a lot of Spanish already in our hallways, but we certainly will encourage and continue to grow that. Um, that, that will be a lot more Spanish in the hallways and a wonderful thing. Um, that we imagine doing assemblies and public events in Spanish. Um, we are already growing our um, multilingual section of the library to represent not only Spanish but many, many other languages. Actually, our librarian just did work last year and just did a really cul wonderful culminating event with some of our kids that are um, dual language um, skilled already, mm -hmm. um, delivering uh, books in their native language to uh, Amherst College. Folks in Amherst, it was a lovely event. Um, so, like I said, uh, community events in Spanish. Hopefully, we, it will be an opportunity for more of our community members to volunteer in our schools. We have um, a good number of people that are volunteering now, but they tend to be um, people that are not as linguistically diverse. So we're hoping to really bridge that gap there, too, um, and have a balanced use of language in all of our publications. As I said before, you know, we so the line that was shared was, uh, speaks, folks that speak Spanish have scrolled long enough, so this is going to be a time <laughs> where Spanish is going to be actually the dominant um, language in many of our publications, and it's, it's overdue for that as well, too. Um, so thinking about our demographics in the community, Fort River students right now, there's 24% of them that have a home language other than English. That's not all Spanish speaking, but we've got a quarter of our population that are um, bilingual already or um, learning English. 
Um, percent of current Fort River students whose first language is Spanish currently is 10.4, but that's K to 6. And if thinking about just our kindergarten students, our, the average for the last four years whose families self-identify as having a Spanish language background is 19. So we do have the population to support such a program, that's for sure, to make sure we meet ratios that are um, really on target to what most uh, programs have. So we have a balance of, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, ba balance of um, what we need for Spanish speaking models as well as English speaking models. I think just adding to that, this is all self-identified in terms of um, families self-identify as having a Spanish language background, so I want to emphasize that, that there's, um, to the point Diane raised earlier, there's a range of what it means to have Spanish in your home, and some people fill out forms in certain ways uh, for a whole host of reasons. So I just want to emphasize that that's a self-identified number, the number of, we expect the number of students who yeah. have exposure to Spanish to be higher greater. than that. Um, yeah, greater than that. Thank yeah. you. Um, yep. Correct math language. Um, <laughs> but um, I just wanted to note the self-identification is a, is a big variable in all that. Great. And I just want to pause here for a second. Uh, we didn't talk about whether or not you wanted us to wait until the end of your sure. presentation for questions or if it's okay for people to just ask Please them as jump they right come in. up. Okay. So does the committee have any questions for either Diane or Katie at this point? Spitzer? So I actually um, read all the slides ahead of time. And when I saw the number 19 in this presentation and the number that you have about 30 kids, every 25 to 30 kids every year in kindergarten, so that really surprised me seeing that potentially there are 19 out of 30, then it's only 11 kids out of the incoming kindergarten class who might not have Spanish exposure at home. And I'm just thinking I'm misinterpreting these numbers. So I yeah. wanted to find out <laughs> what the right interpretation of them is. Because I was taking, I think it's in the next presentation yep. that was uh, dealing with the enrollment. So I don't mean to go too far ahead, but uh, it just seemed like a really high share of the kids. Yeah, that, no, that's forward. a really clear answer. That The 19 is average across the district. district so including oh, okay. all K enrollment, which is why that seems okay. Awesome. So uh, yes, throughout the entire town. Yes, exactly. Okay. That, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> that was my question as well. So okay, great. That was. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sorry, that wasn't clear. In yeah. the last four <laughs> years, so sometimes lower, sometimes mm -hmm. higher. Right. Um, there's a range there. Great, Mr. Dumley. Um, so it's funny, you know. Every time I hear um, a new presentation on this topic. My, my awareness is in like uh, split into two tracks. There's like my heart, which is like, oh my god, this is so awesome. I get so <laughs> excited hearing about this. The the cultural affirmation, the the prominence, like in this day and age, what's happening in this country? It's like it's so great. So, but but to be more productive, okay? I, mean, I, could, just, I could just gush like that all night. But um, you know, so then the other track is okay. You know, analytical and uh, questions and stuff. So um, so we talk about. Um, I, I'm thinking about the other class that's not dual language, mm. and and how like so much of this is awesome for the school culture. Um, when I think about you know assemblies presented in Spanish, you know Spanish being the prominent access point, it, it sounds strange to to think that if you don't speak Spanish or if, you, or if your child's not in a dual language classroom, you might feel uh, like a little it's, you're not as um, centered or I don't know what the word is, but. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've thought through, as you've gone through building up this program, what it's going to be like for the children and staff in, the, in that other class. We are thinking about that. Um, and I can't speak to specifics exactly yet, because it's something that we're thinking about, uh, like... Parallel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's other people have raised the same issue. We don't want kids or families to feel like they're not getting this great thing. Um, I think the education that students are getting now is pretty great also. Uh, <laughs> if I do say so myself. Um, but we want to make sure that there is a little bit of a crossover too, that there's students that mm -hmm. still get exposure to the culture and the language. So it's not like they're just left out in their island on their own. There would be some um, kind of hybridization at some of the more public times, like the assemblies, like lunch, like recess. Mm -hmm. So while they might not be taught directly in Spanish, they're still going to have the same influence and, and still have the arms of Fort River around them. Right. So it's really important that they are integrated and that mm -hmm. everyone feels supported. <clears throat> and I think it's important for us to, to be sort of honest about the fact that um, we're, we are changing a centering, mm -hmm. right? That, mm -hmm. that some folks who haven't been centered may have a little more space in that way. Um, and that some folks that aren't used to that, you know, may feel it at times and that that's okay, right? That that's a productive conversation for mm -hmm. our community to have. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. 
I have one question, actually. Please. It was something that you had mentioned, uh, Ms. Chamberlain, just a, a moment ago, and it was in that one, on that one slide, the school shift to a multilingual mm -hmm. mindset. You had mentioned something about um, that we might not be meeting the state benchmarks. And so it just led me to, to ask uh, myself and to you, um, mm -hmm. so what does that mean for our district, right? If sure. we're not meeting state benchmarks, is mm -hmm. there some sort of, you know, uh, we've seen the, some of the fallout from the MCAS, and, you know, I think a lot of people feel very strongly that mm -hmm. this is an important position for our district to take. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of this specifically, you know, what do you see as there being any, any potential problems? Well, I think people need to understand that um, initially, we might take a hit on MCAS scores because um, while we do expect a balance to be achieved through biliteracy, students will even out, but their initial rates of acquiring literacy skills will be different than they currently are because you're doing two languages simultaneously. So you can't take all of the language information in at the same rate if you're doing one at a time. Um, so, like I said, instead of saying there's a delay, there's not a delay. You're learning two things simultaneously. And but your linguistic resources are mm -hmm. spread right mm -hmm. across, mm -hmm. and they inform each other. So that's that's right. Yeah. So there's a richness that's being developed that isn't developed in a monolinguistic brain, mm -hmm. um, in neuropathways that are being developed that are not um, being developed in a monolinguistic brain. But there will be some different statistical data to look at. Um, and or at least that's what we've about. heard from other districts, mm -hmm. right? We don't know. Right. <laughs> um, we know that after, you know, the, so third grade is the first year that we have MCAS. Four mm -hmm. years in, we should be getting closer. Mm -hmm. There are definitely studies that show students really getting close to that same level of achievement at that place. But the recommendations um, are that they'll really reach by five or six mm -hmm. years in um, to a program that they'll reach sort of equivalency with monolingual peers mm -hmm. in those sorts of measures, right? So, yeah, we have to have that conversation to let folks know, right, that this could look different for a little. And it's really important that we choose the appropriate assessment tools to mm -hmm. make sure we're assessing and measuring progress for students because right. if they're not making progress, we have interventions that we have to put forth, but, but those assessments need to measure exactly what the expectations are for that stage of, of liter literacy development. I think it would be valuable um, to have, you know, some resources for us to look at, like sure. some data. Of, uh, sure. You just mentioned mm -hmm. there's, you know, been uh, some research done. Yeah. If we could see something like that, I think it's just it helps inform our thinking sure. a lot, you know, on on this process. Dr. Morris, you look like you wanted to say something. Yeah, um, <coughs> I think the only thing I'll add, or belabor the point, because I think um, it was stated, but you know, so if the research is indicating it takes five years for students in um, programs that are promoting biliteracy uh, and bilingualism to achieve in English the same way. To, for that to, to be evened out, I think that's one thing and we have that. I think the talking to districts, the more challenging thing in districts like ours that are not so test-centric mm. uh, is the parent expectations mm -hmm. and parents and families being really clear that in first grade, in English, a child may not be achieving or reading at the same level as they would be if they were in a model English classroom, but also knowing the research that this is not a cause for concern, this is actually a really typical rate of development, mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of incumbent on us to share that with the community because lots of families, although they may be enthusiastic in theory about that, they really have to, we have to be really clear with families when they're, this all flies and they're making a choice, to understand that on the front end. Right? It's not fair to families to be like, whoa, I didn't know that mm -hmm. my first grader might not be reading at the level that his or her sibling was five mm -hmm. years ago or four years ago at the same level. I mean, it's really like you know a commitment to the program and a commitment to understand that these things do level off and actually exceed in the future, mm -hmm. but at, at a specific moment, it can be really hard for a family. So, I mean, I think there's the MCAS score piece, which there's a lot of data on, but the more affective piece for, for families is one that I don't want to miss in the mix. And the other thing I think about is, is, is trying to provide resources for the community on how you can support literacy development in the home, in the, in the car, um, mm -hmm. what kind of things can you do to make sure you're having your child just use their language in as many ways as they possibly can, which is something we're still trying to do now in a monolingual mindset, mm -hmm. um, but really um, <coughs> kind of pushing that a little bit and saying if you're supporting mm -hmm. the program, these are some things you can do with your child at home as well. Yeah. And I have to say just from a personal um, you know, sort of anecdote piece for what it's worth, I was working in an early literacy, uh, an organization that was focused on early literacy and early brain development. 
and I also happened to be a bilingual parent, right? And was, you know, at the time, my, my children were actually young toddlers, just learning language. Um, and I started out speaking to them only in Spanish, and my partner would speak to them in English. And before they went to, to preschool, that is how we kind of communicated mm -hmm. with our kids, right? And it was, it was all great. When they started acquiring language, there was a moment where I kind of shut down and mm. stopped speaking to them in Spanish mm. because it felt so vitally important that they be able to acquire language, quote unquote, at the normal rate. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it is definitely, and I was a person who had been trained and understood the importance of all of that, and I came from that personal experience. But when push came to shove, you know, it was my kid, and I wanted that child to, to mm. have language and be able to communicate with me and be able to communicate with my, my husband and do well in preschool, and all mm. of that stuff definitely goes in there. So mm -hmm. right. I think it's something that, not to overstate, I, I think personal yeah. anecdotes, you know, you'll find from both ends, of course, of the spectrum, but that that will be a particular challenge. Um, and as you said, Dr. Morris, I think for parents and caregivers in particular, um, definitely something for us to be very cautious about and to, to be, you know, uh, careful with. Mm -hmm. And to have parent education starting even right. in preschool, right? If we have families that yep. are intending to enter this program, we want to make sure that families feel supported in yeah. building their um, home language, too. Because that's going to help us pre prevent attrition as well. We want people to come to the program and mm -hmm. stay in the program. So, mm -hmm. so I just thought this is <coughs> so exciting, and I wish my kids were younger. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have one, I want to go back to the, the students that are not going to be in sure. this program, um, sort of building on, on your question there. The, because um, you met, you talk about conversational groups during lunch and bringing in community volunteers, and so in what way are you thinking about involving some of those student, the students that aren't in the dual language program and some of those community-wide Spanish mm -hmm. forward um, opportunities, such as the conversational groups, mm -hmm. Um, if an assembly is in Spanish, how are the children that are not in learning Spanish um, or in the dual program, I guess, um, uh, going to be able to participate in that? And then third, is there going to be opportunity for them to learn Spanish, maybe not in a dual language environment, but as a, as a you know, a, a, another curriculum, mm -hmm. part of their regular curriculum? I'm going to try to break it down to a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So I... the last one. Sure. Um, well, the, f the second question is actually one that I feel, find really meaty, right? So if you're not in the dual language program, but you might be experiencing community events in Spanish, you're going to fully participate. And those students are going to have sheltered English instruction in the classroom. Um, and some of the strategies we use for instruction may change because our teachers are going to be fully developed. We're continuing <coughs> to develop their strategies for language development overall. And those are good for both Spanish speaking as well as English speaking and any, any language, right? Um, but we have plenty of students right now who come to our English assemblies and really are working hard. To, to be with us and have to use visual cues and have to use um, mm -hmm. cues from their peers. So the students that are in the monolingual classroom will exercise those skills as well in a way that they haven't ever before. So from from our perspective, it's that it's that dominance and that power dynamic that some students that have been in this place of power are going to get to experience what it's not, like to not be in a place of power and really um, be not only empathetic to their peers but sympathetic and learn in a different way what it's like to, to, to make your way in a place that you might not have everything just provided to you. So I'm really looking forward to that aspect of things and seeing how we can make sure that our staff is prepared to take on that challenge. Um, the other question you asked was, will they, will the students in the monolingual, and again, we're looking for names because we're tired of calling it the monolingual classroom, uh, <laughs> um, will they be directly taught Spanish? At this point, the plan is no. Um, but there certainly will be opportunities for them to participate in community-wide events. So if we are able to pull off having community members do conversational um, things in, in the lunchtime, we would want every student to be able to have that opportunity and learn some of the introductory language and say things like, how are you and, and how are you your weekend and basic conversational skills. We want them to, to get those things as well. And I think through those conversational groups and things like that or through assemblies, they're going to pick up some of that vocabulary at a pace probably faster than you and I would. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know it's faster than you and I would. No <laughs> right, disrespect. Right, no, and that's, <laughs> <laughs> no, and that, that's sort of my question because I'm thinking not about the, the discomfort because that's, that it is, that's how you learn when you're, when you're 
confronted in that situation. Right. But I think also for um, students that may, whose families may have wanted them to be in the in the program and couldn't because of capacity issues. Sure. Right. So there may be a desire to learn learn the language, mm -hmm. and will they have the opportunity to yeah. be other than sort of swimming in it in the assemblies? And yeah. that's more of my question. Yeah. So um, just very briefly, I mean, I don't want to go to the presentation to come, but it's um, for Fort River family. I think the capacity, yeah, can I address that one? I think it's just, I when don't want to you know, start yep. flipping them. Um, <laughs> but just presentations at all, I think. I can address that better in the context mm -hmm. of us. Uh, and I also feel we, we derailed your presentation. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we're about halfway through. Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Spitzer. Two small questions. Um, one was related, um, sorry, to, well, I'm going to go to the one related to Allison's question, which was, I think it's great for those who come from monolingual English-speaking families to have what you're talking about, of that switch from being the dominant to the mm -hmm. no longer dominant. But at least um, I know there are a lot of families who are bilingual, maybe, you know, Chinese. In another language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> English, mm -hmm. and they're struggling in the monolingual, maybe struggling even more in the Spanish class, you know, Spanish assembly. Mm -hmm. And also thinking about, you know, um, you know, I have things like dyslexia or other, you know, language processing issues, mm -hmm. which I'm not an expert on at all, but have family members who have have those, and I know they struggle a lot with reading English, let alone, you know, mm -hmm. trying to do Spanish. So, um, I guess what I would be curious about is for, I think it's great for those high-achieving monolingual kids to have that flip, but I'm one, I, I just want to be sensitive that mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. everybody who's in that non-Spanish mm -hmm. bilingual classroom is going to be having that experience. Um, so, just, I know you guys have probably thought about this, but just stating it, is, you know. Um, it is a good point, yep. and I do, we have some um, structures in place for really um, emergent learners in our level ones. They get mm -hmm. some support in their native language as well, so that would help bridge that gap for okay, sure. Okay, great. And then, and then my other question was when we're talking about that achievement gap, um, thinking about whether or not it's across the subjects, or is it really focused on that obtaining literacy? Like, would, will we, would, should we get parents to be ready to see their kids across the board, mm -hmm. have a little bit, uh, you know, longer time reaching those milestones, mm -hmm. or is it, um, is the evidence focused on the literacy piece? Um, it's really focused on the literacy piece, um, but there are other subject areas that it might influence, like I think about science, right? So you're not going to have all of the vocabulary potentially when you first start taking a science test because you haven't had exposure to it all in English yet. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's something you have worth the thinking. concept, right. yes. Right, so you'll still have grade level concepts. Right. It's just which language you're stronger at expressing them in. And that's something we're thinking so. about in our academic models, and Katie's going to talk a little bit about that, is making sure that we have some different ways to represent all of the curriculum in different languages. and some of our work will be making sure we do shore up vocabulary development in both languages and it's something we're actually thinking about now because it is one of our areas of concern anyway for English learners that the vocabulary development was something that we needed to beef up regardless of the dual language program or not. Mm -hmm. Dr. Morris, did you have a comment or you're, you're good? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to jump back in then. Yes. So Please. some of our recommendations, and we're going to shift to Katie here, but thinking about our work going forward. Um, communication is huge, talking to you folks, talking to everyone in the community, as well as the Fort River staff, enlisting fa and families as partners. And I have to say, like I said before, I've learned a tremendous amount already um, in perspectives that I don't have as a, as a monolingual white woman, perspectives that I've really, really um, started to um, um, seek out at an even deeper level than I had before, which is wonderful. Um, curriculum alignment plans is something that we're thinking about to, to a big degree because of what, exactly what you said, Carrie, that um, we need to make sure we're making benchmarks over time. Um, recruiting fully bilingual staff, um, somebody actually raised the issue too, that we need to make sure a lot of our staff, even if you're teaching just English, potentially as a competency in Spanish as well, to do a lot of that bridging that we need them to. Um, we want to make sure that there's ongoing staff training for everyone at Fort River as well as district-wide too, but to make sure that we're supporting the language development that we need to for all students and sheltering instruction for both Spanish and for English and doing a lot of the bridging that we need to be doing. Um, the next presentation we will make to you and the public is around curricular resources and materials, and that's 
even harder one, I think, to dig into this early in, um, but we're going to try really hard to make sure you understand what we're looking for as far as budget goes and resources goes. Um, one of our um, next steps, as soon as we can pull it off, is meeting with special education, ELL, and intervention staff to think about our service delivery models when we're doing dual language um, and identify those appropriate assessment tools so we are measuring progress for our kids and making sure that they're doing what they need to be doing to acquire both of those languages. So just to clarify, those report um, report and recommendations came from MABE based mm -hmm. on the summer two-day retreat and what we had completed at that point, and then they sort of did a summary of that and gave these recommendations. And I think our to-do list is actually much larger. Oh, yeah. It's not. Okay, great. Great. Okay. So in thinking about the academic program, um, <coughs> Certainly, we've had all of the contact with MABE, but a lot of resources in talking with colleagues and other site visits, asking them you know, for their schedules and their language allocation plan, and how are you doing this piece and that piece. So here's just listed a few of those. Um, and we have some upcoming visits, and we'll continue to reach out to other colleagues. Um, in addition to, so the, this Guiding Principles for Dual Language Education is sort of the um, go-to book from MABE, but there's a lot of resources and we're really starting to dig into what else do we need to know, um, what research, what resources. Um, some of that's happening in the leadership team, some of that will go to a professional learning community that's happening at Fort River among their staff. So there's different levels of um, engaging with that research. So in terms of the considerations, um, so there's a lot of them, right? Of course, it's kind of how do we take what we already do and shift it into this 50-50 model? Um, the first thing to think about is the fact that 50-50 is actually pretty hard to achieve because when we say 50% of the day is in Spanish, we're thinking about to begin with, just the day at school, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole world, right, the, the water that the fish are swimming in is in English, right? So we really need to elevate the Spanish mm -hmm. to be really sure that we are actually getting to that 50% um, and continue to just have that that shift in our thinking, right, to, to make sure. Because um, something that we heard from Mabe is that, you know, it's very easy to lose the Spanish instructional time, mm -hmm. right? Um, for example, specials, right? If we, if you'll see that we included specials in the English time because we don't have staff yet that are able to teach across specials in Spanish. Um, so really quickly, you, you know, you need to sort of defend that time to make sure that the level of exposure in Spanish and the level of instruction is there. Um, we are hoping to really build the literacy foundation in Spanish in a big way because research shows that for English learners that is a huge asset um, and helps promote their academic success long term if they learn how to read and write in their first language first and then transfer those skills. Um, that being said, we also have research that says you can do both at the same time. They're not going to be confused, right? And, and we do want to make sure that there is some explicit literacy instruction and foundational skills. Um, the, you know, the recent move towards the K-2 phonics focused curriculum in the district is not something that people feel comfortable getting rid of, so mm -hmm. we'll make sure to include that piece while giving more priority to Spanish literacy right up front. Um, we know that that literacy is also being built on a foundation of oral language, and our Spanish speakers will be coming with that foundation to build from. Um, but regardless, across dual language programs, oral language is a huge component of the curriculum and, and making sure that there's a lot of authentic academic conversation. Um, we we want to make sure that when we're teaching in Spanish, we're using authentic methods and authentic materials, that we're not always using translations mm -hmm. of English materials, and that we're not pretending that the structure of the Spanish language is the same as the English language. Examples are that their vowel structure is really different, so it doesn't make sense to sort of parallel the way that we do phonics in English. Um, Spanish is much more syllabic in the way that you think about reading it, so the instruction looks different. Um, so that's a piece that we're learning more and more about is sort of what, what do we need to think about and how do we do that in a way that's authentic to, 
to what that language um, is made of, right, foundationally. And we want to make sure we're bridging across contexts. When we say bridging, we mean to make sure that even if, say, math is taught for a whole year in one language, that there's some exposure to the math language in the other, in the partner language, so that students have a little bit of cross uh, language connection, even if it's not the primary teaching. So all of that said, here's the first draft, and really it's a draft. Um, we did a lot of thinking with our um, leadership team, but you know there's there's things to keep teasing out and considering. And this um, is really only just one possibility, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. The main idea you see in terms of structure is that half the day is in English, half is in Spanish, right? So the green and blue flip. Um, and we really wanted to have lunch and recess at the same time across the grade level. So both the dual language classes and the monolingual class so that everybody could have those times together, both for community building but also for these opportunities for language exposure. Um, so that's a piece that I think we're, we're feeling pretty good mm -hmm. about in terms of, you know, the draftiness. Mm -hmm. um, but we're looking at, so uh, one sort of discussion is around, do we integrate unit study and literacy? Um, certainly a lot of dual language programs use that kind of a model because there's a lot of crossover and it makes sense to sort of bridge um, across the content with the language. And just for clarification, unit study is typically where we yes. deliver our social studies and our science curriculum. Thank you. Yep. Right. <laughs> um, so that's one thing that we're considering um, originally, or another draft of this, is that unit study could be on the English side where the centers are, right? But our, um, there was some conversation about wanting to have more space for interactive small group work on the English side, which is why this draft has the centers there for literacy and math, and the integrated language arts and unit study. Um, another consideration is that in order for this to work, our teaching in Spanish has to actually be more of the day, because the specials happen in English, right? So we're looking for creative solutions about how to, um, how to make that work, because the person who's teaching Spanish can't physically teach the number of minutes that are up there. Mm -hmm. The gap is about 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at options in terms of bringing in support from, maybe it's for the social emotional curriculum, maybe it's for some of that oral language block, um, and that could be from folks that we have in the building. Long term we may look at other options, you know, if our um, sources of folks that can provide that instruction wear thin, but we actually do have a lot of people mm -hmm. um, right now in Fort River that have the potential to do that kind of work with us. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think, what else is in here? So thinking about English learners, um, mm -hmm. it's important to say that we often provide interpreters for our beginners. This model removes that support. Um, the idea is that really when you're teaching in English, you're teaching in English and you're sheltering effectively, and when you're in Spanish, you're in Spanish, and you're sheltering effectively. Um, Dr. Morris, did you want to say I, something? I thought there was a question oh. from the oh. committee member, and I thought mm -hmm. before we went on beyond sure. the schedule. It's family? Yeah, so um, I, I find the, the waterfall concept really interesting, in that you have like essentially That's an fun. entire day in one language. Yeah, yeah so it's, that right. Um, That's the next slide. But, uh, but actually on the previous slide, the, the, mm -hmm. so, so I see that benefit. The question the thing that um, stands out to me in this is that the start and end times in one day are all different on the next day. And so, like when I think about kids and going to school and how you get acclimated to going to school, you start to get used to a routine, mm. right? And that, oh, it's 9.30, that means that's when we do art. It's uh, after lunch, then we all do this. And it's all sort of broken up in the same way. So mm -hmm. that it, every, and so you, you're pulsed at a time every day, mm -hmm. where this is, seems more cognitively challenging. I, mean, I understand this is one aspect of an uh, immersion program, but mm -hmm. the language piece aside, mm -hmm. like even this was, if this was all taught in English, this might be a little challenging for some, for some learners. Like I, I know there's some kids on the autistic spe spectrum that are very schedule oriented, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm wondering if, if this is like another challenge in terms of like laying out the schedule, that it's, um, it's not just that the things are different, but that the, the sizes of the blocks and where it happens in the morning are different. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess as you're going through the research and, and, and site visits, you know, it's something to get 
get, maybe get some And it's definitely on. been a really big help for us is seeing model schedules for yeah. sure. Um, what does work, what doesn't work. And everybody has a very strong opinion about that for sure. <laughs> um, and some people really think that waterfall of starting one day in English and the next day in Spanish is balances that, <coughs> and that the kids are far more adaptable than we as adults are <laughs> and that's where that's where our tools like visual schedules um, will certainly help students that are that are struggling a little bit more around what predictability but my guess is in short order it will be predictable even though it seems erratic um, if it's like I think about the middle school model right now that there's drop schedules and high school kids drop schedules and mm -hmm. they've got it and, and, and that's I, hard for yeah. me uh-huh yeah. <laughs> yeah. and I would add to that just my experience in other schools we'll talk Actually, this might be a good segue to the next slide because it's sort okay. of... Okay. Um, okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, like, because I think Katie or Dan can explain waterfall or consistent mm -hmm. daily schedule. Um, but the, what, what Ms. Chamberlain said is, is what we hear is that the students, you know, uh, are able to acclimate because it's what they know, you know, to a certain extent and because they're younger and their minds are more pliable mm -hmm. and flexible. But um, I think having a schedule that is the same every single day is a construct that we've created. Um, and it may be helpful, but it, it's only become the norm because we've created and set it that way. And so what we heard, because we asked that expression explicitly in uh, Harrisonburg when, when mm -hmm. Schwitzer and I were there and they asked it in some of the other places, is that what they find is that, again, kids are more adaptable, but sometimes they're more adaptable because their lives are not set in schedules the way adult lives are. And it's the adults actually who struggle more with mm -hmm. having a schedule that might be different on it. Uh, doesn't have the same routine, and so there actually needs to be some work done with the adults around professional development of how that might look like. What, how might you expect different mm -hmm. things from a kindergartner if you're teaching math at 2.10 instead of 9.20? Mm -hmm. right? There's like a pretty wide variation of five-year-olds at those two times, and so a lot of the work actually is on the adult end. It's all for the benefit of kids, but in terms of right. who struggles and who needs support, um, the adults really have to gauge their um, expectations based on where they are in a day, especially with the youngest students. And that's it, part of the reason to do it, right, is that kids <coughs> attend differently throughout the day, so you don't want to always have one language at one part of the day. But so how do you manage that is the question, which is what these options are about. And I do appreciate you bringing up students that struggle with that, and mm -hmm. I think that we have currently even a lot of supports in place for supporting flexible thinking and pre-teaching and setting up, like I said, with visual schedules and posting schedules and making sure students do get that sense of routine even when it seems like it's not routine. <laughs> and the accommodations that are necessary, we can implement in any setting. I guess just one final thought on that, particularly because it's this is a program that begins at the kindergarten level, is that um, and I'm sure you've already thought about this, but just to, to emphasize the point that that, that close working with the, the special education specialists, mm -hmm. whether kids have one-to-one -one aids or shared aid or, or no aid at all, you know, like honing in on exactly what is the obstacle mm -hmm. that student is facing in order to hook into this thing so that it becomes regular and so right. that it's not an issue mm -hmm. is, is like so incredibly important. Like, you know, a, a kid might be having an issue adapting to it that has nothing at all to do right. with dual language structure. Yeah. Right? It might be their own issue and it's, and it's just a little bit more difficult mm -hmm. to see that because there's so much other new stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So you might say, oh, well, well, it's a dual language thing, they'll get used to it. And that's when you really need those eyes on the ground, you know, that right. real focus mm -hmm. of saying, you know what, I've worked with kids, you know, in other settings, you know, this person needs this. And right. Yeah. And I think that that's, I'm glad you raised that point because that's something we heard, I heard in all three sites is that anytime there's any concern, it's a logical thing to be like, is it the dual language program? Mm -hmm. And what every district finds is that the same, if, let's pretend it's a um, student who's displaying um, negative behaviors, for instance. That it's, you have to look at it with that lens, but it, it, it's easy to go, oh, well, if they weren't learning two languages, and then the results when they've had students remove is that the, the behaviors look the same, they're just mm -hmm. all in English, right? <laughs> it's like, it's not that it's a function of the program, but I think because it is different and new and not the way many adults mm -hmm. were raised, um, some, but not many in terms of having an academic program in two languages. Um, you have to be really cautious about that, because um, yeah. how, how to speak <coughs> about that. And I think your point's well served about making sure special ed staff are in on the conversations. Mm -hmm. and I think that's mm -hmm. spoke about that better earlier. Yeah. And I would think that, um, just to add to that, you know, it, some of these issues 
can almost feel like they, they could potentially make or break a program, right? Mm -hmm. Because people get so entrenched and so concerned or, you know, they're, they're not understanding what's happening. It almost begs uh, the need for, like, you know, um, specific brochures, if you will, or handouts, mm -hmm. right, on each one of these potential concerns. Like, you see almost like a dozen of them mm -hmm. that are given out or made mm -hmm. available, right, to, you know, and you probably have all this material already. But just, you know, if, if somebody's having a concern about, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, somebody's acting out and, you know, and how do we deal with that, you hand them this thing and say, here's the research, we can talk about it, mm -hmm. let's right. provide, you know, some support for this, but it's already been discussed and thought about and researched previously and here's information mm -hmm. to help at least, you know, engage that. Um, making a, that kind of information available on a regular basis feels really important, right? Like as, mm -hmm. as people are learning about it, as we're all learning about it, you know, yeah. we'll want to make sure we're mm -hmm. educating. Yeah, and before we get to this, just to, to comment, uh, just to respond to that briefly, I agree, and one of the huge advantages Fort River has on the staffing model is that two of their mental health professionals are fully bilingual and can think through, you know, what's language acquisition, mm -hmm. what's not language acquisition, and it's really a huge advantage that mm -hmm. Fort River has now in general to have that level of bilingual mental health staff, but particularly as we go down this road, it'll become, I think, even more crucial. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And I have to say, um, our behavioral health team is phenomenal as well and can really dig deep into what is the function of a student's behavior mm -hmm. pretty well. So we've talked about this without saying it, but there's the water food, so some options in terms of um, this idea that we need to teach in both languages. We need it to be balanced, but we don't always want to have the same part of the day in the same language. So we could look at this idea of a waterfall where it switches every day. Um, some benefits there are things like the continuity. So if in the afternoon there's some issue or challenge, the same teacher has that student in the morning to follow up, right? Um, on the other side, you know, we are always um, sending home the folders, right, that, go, that come in from home and go back home at, in the afternoon. And so thinking about, okay, well, how are we going to send homeschool folders and manage that, right? So there's going to be logistical challenges, um, but there's also benefits. The consistent daily schedule option could happen that you have, you know, say one group has English in the morning and Spanish in the afternoon, that that stays the same for a week or a month or half the year. Um, so we've been talking about those options too. Certainly adults tend to gravitate to that first mm -hmm. just in terms of their thinking about their teaching day, right, and kind of how do we manage. Um, <coughs> but you know, there, there's benefits on either side. So I guess we haven't landed. Right. And here's where the data is is pretty ambiguous. Like both models are successful yes. and have wonderful outcomes. So right. this and is going to come down to a preference. To, yeah. yeah, right. Different yeah. schools do it different ways. No one seems to have an issue mm -hmm. specifically with this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, something that is interesting, too, as we start to think about the what the program looks like for the continuing grades, right, so first through sixth, um, the idea of whether to maintain, for example, math is taught in Spanish in first grade, or is math taught in Spanish for half the year and then in English for half the year, right? That's a conversation we're having mm -hmm. right now, particularly as we think about resources, mm -hmm. because that affects how we design the materials and resources mm -hmm. we need. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's the level of even if the same subjects are taught in the same language, the flipping that could happen, as well as um, when we look at subject matter mm. and whether that stays consistent for a year. Um, it seems like more of the models, see if you agree, <coughs> but more of them have this, the consistency across the year mm -hmm. and flip-flop year to year. So, right. for example, math in Spanish in first grade, English in second, um, you know, back and forth. Um, but either way is possible. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Yeah, and I'll say some of that, too. We're having conversations with like, our science coordinator to say, mm -hmm. what do you think about this? Right? So we're reaching out to different folks in the district to have those conversations, too, about what could make sense. Um, so in terms of all of the additional services that students receive, we are aiming for as much inclusion as possible. Um, we're hoping to continue co-teaching mm -hmm. as much as possible. We have a strong commitment to co-teaching both for special education and for English learners. Um, as well as some great things happening with our speech and language. And, you know, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of folks doing that work 
and we'd love to see that continue. Um, and just really ha try to have a team-based approach to meet the needs when they arise, um, trying to see where where the pockets within the day that, you know, is there a time for in centers where somebody could come in and have a small group? Um, is there a time during the oral language, if that's a speech and language person's role, to, to work with students on grammar and that sort of thing? And that model's not um, new either. In the last two years, right. we've been having our intervention teachers go in, especially at the K-1 and 2 level. Mm -hmm. right. So the small group instruction is, is at least a focus of a half an hour of literacy. Mm -hmm. And a long-term goal is that we would hope to have intervention in both languages so that if a student needs intervention, regardless of their first language, right, if they're not meeting sort of the benchmarks that we expect in their, say, literacy <coughs> progress in either language, that we could provide intervention in that language, the one that is harder for them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a longer-term, you know, opportunity and challenge, um, staffing-wise. Can I just ask a, a quick follow-up question to that? Sure. So, again, benchmarks. Um, is there, you know, some sort of best practices on how you measure benchmarks for second language acquisition? Because it seems like such a, a thing that would vary so greatly, mm -hmm. perhaps even more so than just, you know, monolingual acquisition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any? So we are looking at some different models. Um, sometimes, like one example curriculum that we're looking at has some. Um, assessment tools in both languages and their sort of regular progression mm -hmm. and so they give you a sense of what they would expect. Um, of course like anything we'll have to apply it to our context and see how it works uh, for our students because there always will be some variation. Additionally something that's um, happening that's kind of interesting right now, maybe interesting, maybe boring, but in my <laughs> world kind of interesting is that the um, the Department of Education is looking at English learner benchmarks mm -hmm. in general, and MABE <coughs> has pushed back and said that the, the way that they're proposing the benchmarks really is focused on English-only programs mm -hmm. and isn't accounting for the, the different ways that language may develop. So that conversation is happening on a larger level, too. <laughs> I think our timing is pretty ideal because the Look Act was just passed recently, and, and right. these conversations are now reignited in a, in a bigger way, which is yeah. helpful for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'll add um, is that MABE also <coughs> is facilitating it in December. Mm -hmm. um, so they're offering professional development for their <coughs> network, which is dual language schools in New England, uh, around this question of benchmark. Mm -hmm. So even schools that have been doing it a long time, they're still trying to figure out Right. How do we benchmark? So they're having some best practices presented, mm -hmm. um, and I think Ms. Richardson is going to that um, conference or meeting uh, to come back with, you know, what are people trying, what's working, um, because there's not a huge level of literature on a topic for all the reasons that both of you mentioned, mm -hmm. actually. It's like, what does it mean right. to be learning the second language? Well, it really depends on, really matters for your academic language and your first language. Yeah. That's right. a large impact on your acquisition right. timeline and, right. and the second language. So, you know, having these, like, kind of standard benchmark, like, what does that actually functionally mean, um, sort of was trying to get at this quote about MCAS two weeks ago that I think got lost in the Gazette. Um, not because they didn't try, it's just too complicated to, try to describe. Uh, I didn't do a good job talking about it, but um, but I think we're going to learn from other districts and experts in the area, and it's nice to know everyone is working on it, even if they're not a new program, they're continually refining this. That very topic. I'm glad you mentioned other districts because I think that's yeah. how we can use our partner schools that we're going to visit mm -hmm. in, a, in a big way. So what are they using for tools already? Yeah. Right. And knowing that, again, for me it's exciting because a lot of our standardized tests aren't normed for English learners, period, and we're using them all the time, and we're doing the best we can to make that <coughs> equitable and to have the conversation about how do we interpret that data, but that's that's happening yeah. all over the place. Yep. So, Thank you. Yep. Um, so we've talked about this some, but this is a slide from our um, MABE, our two days with MABE on sheltering and the importance of that. Um, we... This is essential for English learners across all of our programs. It's good for everybody across all of our programs, um, but it's essential within this dual language structure. We saw when we were visiting um, that, uh, so a classroom that Dr. Morris and I visited, we saw that the Spanish was very well sheltered, but the English was not very well sheltered. So this is something that we need to be really attentive to, right? That it's new and maybe the, the use of these techniques to provide access for our English speakers learning Spanish would be more, there'd be more focus there, right? But in the English speaking classroom, there was less focus um, for the Spanish speakers learning English. This is again, something we're working on across the board. Mm -hmm. um, 
but just making sure that for whichever language you are learning in and for whichever language is stronger or you know a combination of linguistic backgrounds that you're bringing that the teachers are providing instruction in a way that allows you to access content um, so that's an ongoing mm -hmm. process and the you know those are some examples <coughs> but there's a lot of work around this um, from different sources that we're sort of pulling together So some of these ongoing work things have been mentioned. Um, we have an action plan that's guiding our leadership team, which is a smaller group, and then we have also bi-monthly meetings of a dual language planning committee, which is larger, and we hope to open up even larger once we have the vote um, to know if we're going forward, but uh, that will include parents, staff, whoever basically wants to jump in there with us and, and help figure this out. Um, the Literacy Benchmarks workshop we just mentioned, Mabe also has a spring conference, and we continue to be in consultation with Mabe, with other districts and other leaders to say, hey, how are you doing this thing? And you know, what did you learn about benchmarks when you started? All of those kinds of questions. Um, and certainly the family participation <coughs> has been essential and will continue to be essential. Mm -hmm. um, we're lucky to have a strong, you know, I think you mentioned the, the size of the email list already. So a lot of folks that are interested in having this conversation and um, sharing their experience, their input, their expertise. So that's been great. And just a quick note, I think the slide, um, this previous one that you just had on the screen is a little bit different than the printout that's here, but uh, I don't know if... Yeah, yeah so, I think there was just a yeah. couple of addition or gotcha. yeah, yeah, a little tweak. Um, and then in terms of human resources, so obviously, as has been mentioned, we're looking for bilingual staff. <coughs> this is already true. Mm -hmm. um, continue, it is a district priority and continues to be in terms of this program. So as vacancies come up, we'll be looking to hire more bilingual staff, bilingual bicultural, um, even better. And we have the Para to Teacher Pathways program, so we have a lot of folks working in the district that long-term could be receiving training to, to work or build towards participation in this way. Um, and we know that over time we're gonna maybe have you know more need to focus on special education staff, reading specialists, um, our librarians and our teachers and all, right? There's just all of those roles um, Long term, we would love to see have more opportunity for bilingual staff, and we're also looking to partner with the local universities to help build the credentials uh, for folks to teach in the dual language program, regardless of which language they're teaching in, so that they have that background and knowledge and skills to effectively teach. Mr. Demling? Yeah, that, that local university connection seems like just a natural. Yeah. Potential untapped resource. I mean, you could totally some place as big as UMass that's as open as UMass. You can completely imagine like a, a dual language teaching program starting there because of what we're doing here, and then having a natural cooperation between. You know, we provide <laughs> internship programs in the town. Right. They provide a staff that we need, and um, yeah, it could be a really certainly something that I would imagine teaching uh, colleges would be. I think when dual language programs are restricted, a mm -hmm. lot of that shut down, and now that they're opening right. up again, the opportunity does yeah. exist. Yeah. Right. You know, um, a board member from Mabe just uh, recently came to work as a professor at UMass. So I met with her a week or two ago, and she has lots of ideas, as you might imagine, about how to do that. You know, UMass is a large institution, and, and that comes with strengths and challenges, certainly, but also the fact that Holyoke now has two programs, so it's not just mm -hmm. Amherst in terms of the local area. There's at least two other ones, um, two other elementary schools with programs that are growing. One mm -hmm. just started kindergarten this year. I think that caps up to third grade, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so I think you know, once we get to closer to a critical mass, I think universities can maybe, um, right, they, they see the critical mass and they, they want to be involved a little more than if it's just one program. Okay. So the last is just a summary. Um, that we've seen a lot of great enthusiasm. We're doing a lot of work to try to really engage all of the stakeholders um, across this process, and we're looking at the research. It's really going to be iterative, going back to the drawing board, and you know, how do we improve this? And we bring it back to staff, we bring it back to families, and continue to work through that. Um, but we're excited about the mm -hmm. potential. Yeah, and maybe I'll just <coughs> if I can jump in with one last comment. Is I really want to thank. 
you know, Ms. Chamberlain, Ms. Richardson. So I started by talking about how the Mabe folks who did the La Siembra training were so impressed that the Google Docs kept on growing and growing and growing. And that happened not just because the two individuals to my right were doing the work, it's because they facilitated a process that's had multiple staff members, multiple community members, able to offer input and a structure where there's regular meetings that happen. Um, so it's not just haphazard, oh yeah, we forgot about that thing, let's get together. This is regularly scheduled and structures there for success. I really want to thank the two of them who have done incredible amounts of, of, of honestly pretty quiet work. Right? It's not like, it's like okay, we're going to schedule this, let's, where does it fit in the schedule? Right? It's not the dramatic work um, that sometimes you see, but it's the quiet, steady work that leads, in my opinion, to you know, a successful progress on this program. So I really want to thank them publicly. But not and too and quiet. the team. Not too quiet, right? <laughs> yeah, what is the quote? Uh, quieter than the silence, but, or no, louder than the, I'm going to forget it. Uh, I'll get it. <laughs> quote. Um, quieter than the noise, but louder than the silence. I don't know. Something like that. I'll get it eventually. But really, they deserve the kudos for, um, for leading the work. It's not just, what I meant to say with the quiet work is it's not just the information sessions and the connections that are public events. It's, it's actually just setting the stage for continual focus over time. It's not just like, oh, we're just going to day and figure this out. It's like, no, we're going to meet very regularly and chip away and chip away and make progress and make progress that we're satisfied and shared and then get more feedback and go back and revise. You know, it, that's the kind of work that I've seen. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. It's been very impressive uh, just understanding the process of acquiring all of this information and, you know, learning about it and then coming back to us and suffering through our endless questions. But we really appreciate it. Are there any other questions or comments from the committee? I just have one, and I want to say thank you so much for this work. I'm excited about it. Um, I guess, given that we're talking about voting in a couple weeks to make this happen in 2019, Paul, are you guys feeling, um, how do you feel about implementing this in 2019? <laughs> do you feel like that's a reasonable timeline, and, or, and do you have any concerns about that timeline? I do think it's a reasonable timeline. There's um, mm -hmm. other districts that we've heard from that have had a summer to put a program together and <laughs> are astonished that we've had a whole year. Um, <laughs> It's, it is a lot of work for sure, but I think it's not just a credit to Katie and myself. It's, we've got a group of people that are really committed to making this work and see the equity side of things as um, really an essential mm -hmm. part of our schoolings. Uh, so it's a dedicated bunch of people that are going to make it happen for sure and a dedicated community that's going to support it. So, good. Yeah. I just, if I, would, if I could add to that, um, and I don't, this is authentic, I don't want it to sound um, cliche, but. <coughs> Um, I don't think you know this yet, that MABE is presenting at the MASS, MASC conference in November, and they actually asked me the other day, I don't think I've told you, sorry, um, <laughs> that they actually want to use the work of Fort River as an example about a thorough planning process. Nice. Not that it's done, but ironically, their presentation is like the week of November 6th, so it's like, <laughs> you know, hopefully we'll get to a positive result at the end of that. Could be awkward, they, they yeah. asked for you know, permission to use some of the documents that nice. have, have been developed. Um, but the other thing I want to say, to take a step back, because I think we're talking about the monolingual classroom, but I'm also responsible for all three schools in the district, as, as Katie is as well, and Diane in spirit is, uh, too, and, and just how much it influences things. So tomorrow, um, I don't think either of you know yet, but so we have our district instructional leadership team, and one thing that we do from time to time we're doing tomorrow is we're watching a video of teaching, and we collectively practice our observation skills so that when our people observing lessons go in. And so I was looking for a video because I'm facilitating this section and actually we're watching a video in Spanish taught in a dual language school tomorrow. And it's not for Diane or Renee or Fort Rivers credit, it's actually just we should all be thinking about the dual language learners that we have. And uh, one way to ensure that there are students who aren't competent uh, yet you know, or um, it wasn't their first language is in dual language programs, you know not everybody speaks the language, speaks Spanish. Um, so it's really pushing the envelope not just for these folks, but actually for all of us to think about our English language learners and how are we supporting them and what sheltering strategies do we see or not see in this lesson. Uh, and it's going to push all of us to think a little differently because it's going to be in Spanish and the majority of our administrative team does not speak Spanish. How do we observe that? And certainly at the high school level and the middle school level, right, not all of our administrators speak Spanish, mm -hmm. Latin, French, <laughs> right, and so on. But uh, for all of us to think about what is it about English language learners, in this case it would be Spanish language learners. Uh, who are going to be the primary focus of our lesson. So I think there are broad implications well beyond Fort River of us thinking more globally about who our students are, what are they learning, and how do we get better at making sure they have full access to the mm -hmm. curriculum. And I do think it's helpful to think about it as a seven-year process, right? Mm -hmm. We're doing a lot of work to make sure kindergarten gets up to speed and really thinking 
pretty closely behind that around first grade. They're kind of in partnership right now, K and one. But we know that we have seven years if it moves forward to get it completely um, integrated and implemented across the school. So it is an immense amount of work. I'll have to, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but because I think we have so many people that are committed, I think it's doable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. We'll see you soon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, you need that too. I do, because I have a presentation. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, moving us along, the next item on the agenda, I'm not sure if we've actually tackled the communications and forums planning yet that's on the agenda, or are we moving straight into draft enrollment? Uh, would, it, would it make sense just to roll through? I mean, yeah, yeah that's my sense. I think I mentioned to Ms. Westmoreland I was regretting having ordered it that way. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so draft enrollment model. Um, so just process-wise, just um, for people who weren't connecting with us in the summer, we had multiple meetings. Uh, the Amherst School Committee had multiple meetings on this topic. Uh, there were three general possibilities talked about. Uh, one was a hybrid lottery, <coughs> which we'll talk more, depth, more in depth about in a minute. One was an enrollment map change, so literally changing the lines of who goes to which school geographically. And one was on a full lottery, two enrollment zones. That was suggesting that Fort River would no longer have an enrollment zone and that it would just be Crocker Farm and Wildwood being enrollment zones and Fort River would just get a lottery. So we looked at all three of those models and all of us, I think, collectively, there wasn't a vote, but I think by assent, you know, felt like the hybrid lottery system was preferable for a whole whole number, whole host of reasons. Um, so, you know, feedback from this presentation as well as the last topic where we plan a form would be integrated. And I'd like to come back and present in a little finer detail based on feedback. October 22nd, not necessarily a full, th probably this length presentation, but um, this is a first go at trying to concretize what we talked about in the summer. Um, so I know that there'll be feedback here as well as from the community. Um, and that I'd want to have a final draft in time for your vote on a uh, potential vote on November 5th. Um, and, you know, I did some work on what other districts in Massachusetts have for policies, because uh, enrollment typically and zoning typically does have a policy in my, from my vantage point. Um, and I'll get to that in a later slide. Um, so here's a current r enrollment map. So I want to just suggest that I'm not looking to, I'm not suggesting that we change any of the lines that are on this boundary. There may just be uh, a different zoning process around dual language, but you know, there's no suggestion that any line should move north, south, east, or west. But I wanted to just kind of return to this map. Um, so an additional piece of context is that, um, as I've said multiple times, that we're trying to ensure that the program works for all students, but primarily for students who are Spanish-speaking English learners. Uh, it's a population of students who, uh, despite our best efforts, our achievement gap still exists, and it's pretty significant between those students and uh, the general population in our district. <coughs> and that the research indicates that dual language programs are the best, one of the best interventions that one could have, the best programs one could have. So the italics part is important. We are not placing students by default in the dual language program. We're not taking anyone who suggests that they speak English, Spanish at home and forcing anyone to be part of any program. So I just want to, I think that can get lost mm -hmm. in. Um, and things. The other thing is that we'll have, we know we'll have English language learners, Spanish speaking, as well as students who speak other languages other than Spanish in our other schools, and we're just as dedicated to make sure they have the resources they need to be successful. This is not at the, um, it's not precluding the work that needs to happen, sheltering all the things that were spoken about before that are uh, important for all students, particularly ELL students. They need to happen across all three of our schools. This is not the only school that's going to work for ELL students or Spanish, ELL stu Spanish speaking ELL students. So I think it's just want to emphasize that point because we're, again, op we're talking about Fort River, but we're also responsible for all students in the district. So here's the current enrollment policy. Um, I'm not going to read it, um, but it's a policy JC attendance areas. I'll talk about my policy search sleuthing in, in a bit, um, but this is the current one, and it's been around for quite some time. And... Um, Essentially, it just, um, with the exception of open enrollment policy, which got a second, which doesn't exist right now in an active way or special education placement, it sets the boundaries um, and sets some interest around how zones are created. So the last time this was 
We changed attendance areas was in 2009, implemented in the 2010 school year. But this policy was used to kind of define those boundaries. For about eight years, in the early 2000s, until 2009, there was also an enrol open enrollment policy. And that open enrollment policy allowed families to request to be in a specific, have their child attend a specific school if space allowed, and they were willing to provide transportation. Uh, my recollection in 2009 as to why this was suspended is it was part and parcel of the redistricting that the committee felt like if they kept this policy open, the redistricting to balance socioeconomic needs wouldn't happen, that people would try to find spaces. And uh, the other conversation I remember was it advantages families with who can provide transportation and it wasn't consistent with the district's um, ethical and moral responsibility to mm -hmm. not advantage someone based on socioeconomic needs. So I just put it up because someone might ask, oh, didn't we used to have an open enrollment policy? I'm not suggesting that we open that up again. I just thought it was relevant. Um, so I looked at the Massachusetts districts. I didn't so much look at Boston, like has a dual language program. Their attendance, right, that would be, someone could write a dissertation, right? Uh, you might know about that one, uh, about how zoning works in, in some of the districts. But I tried to find districts in Massachusetts that have dual language programs, where they had specific policies that detailed how they dealt with it. Um, so most of the districts didn't, and the ones that did, for instance, Cambridge and Somerville, they both have controlled choice programs that define zoning well beyond a dual language program that's much larger than what we're, I think, talking about here. Um, but Milton and Holliston were examples to, um, of policies that um, I thought were helpful to describe who got in, you know, in, in similar way, in not analogous ways, but at least some similarities to what we're talking about. I think the distinction here is that Milton and Holliston, uh, Milton's a uh, French immersion program, so they don't have many native speakers of French, mm -hmm. so that's not as much a consideration. Holliston is, uh, does not have a high ELL population, so the similarity is who gets in, who gets out of a program that might be seen as attractive by some, but it doesn't, didn't, I couldn't find ones that had the true native speaker um, population um, variable. So it was really unsatisfying, and many of these districts don't even have policy JC in general, the attendance mm -hmm. area policy. It's just absent from their uh, policy manuals. So uh, I was expecting to have great examples to share with you, and I mm -hmm. did so not. Um, I did talk to Mr. Bockelman, our <coughs> town manager, because he was the chair of the Somerville School Committee, about their, if anyone has a lot of time in their hands, you can look at their policy manual. I would guess it's three times the size of the MSC one, which is ours is based out of. Um, it's very, very detailed. It's actually very interesting. And that one does have some, you know, these are all hyperlinks. So probably is worth reading because they do have a, a decent size um, Spanish speaking population in Somerville. Uh, but again, because it's part of a larger district's larger vision for enrollment, it, you know, you have to sort of, tr I found myself sort of translating what that would mean in Amherst. So I didn't come with a policy draft. I just wanted to say I did the policy search and, um, I was hoping to have a little more clarity than I did on what that policy might look like. Um, so research into dual language programs and demographics. Um, so what we know is that for programs to be as successful as we'd want them to be, that we want language models in both Spanish and English, both as partner languages, uh, preferably as evenly as possible. I think MABE is, that was the old, kind of the old philosophy was the 50-50 uh, split for students. And that's still not a bad idea, but I think as more districts it didn't have, um, well, two things have happened. One, dual language programs are starting to occur in more suburban districts. Um, they were more typical in urban districts for a while. And so that's had a play on itself. But even places like Holyoke, where roughly 80% of the students are Latino and their ELL percentage is, is significantly lower than one might predict, uh, given the demographics of Holyoke, people had to really think about what does it mean to be bilingual? You know, it gets to some of the slides that were presented earlier. This binary system of either Spanish dominant or English dominant doesn't really apply. Uh, and what we know is that over 20% of the students in the elementary district are exposed to Spanish at home, which is roughly 30 students at grade level. Again, that's more than that number of first language, um, but we know that there's difference between exposure. I mean, not to harp on your personal anecdote, but that's a pretty, pers uh, it's n you're not alone in that personal anecdote of families who are Spanish is spoken in the home, but not necessarily um, all the time, or students may not <coughs> respond in Spanish, but they have exposure to hearing <coughs> Spanish quite frequently. Um, you've seen this before, but this is the bilingual continuum that one of our trainers um, from La Siembra, who worked in Wyndham, Connecticut, developed, uh, which is a, it's a parent self-identification screener. Again, I only put up the English, last time I showed the English and Spanish version of this. 
but it's trying to get a sense for families when they are particularly interested uh, to do some self-assessment along the way around how much students may speak um, or hear Spanish in the home. We know when we do screenings, which I'll get to in a second, some students are excited and they're happy to speak in any language at their screening. And for some students, the whole screening experience is one that um, they may not be as comfortable speaking in any language, depending on you know lots of dynamics. Um, I could tell a personal anecdote, not my prone, but some of my family around that one as well. I mean, just very frankly, for for some students, um, they get the cue that, you know, the fish you know, the fish in the water analogy Ms. Richardson used, that English is the right language to use at school. So we have to be really cautious about what students are showing us when they come in for a screening. I think we do a great job of making a welcome environment, having bilingual staff there, and yet for some students, they walk into a school that says, Wildwood Elementary on the front, they see all the signs in English, and there are nonverbal cues for young children to say, I think I'm supposed to do English here. Um, so we know that that screening experience doesn't always get all the information we'd always hope, and they're also, like, not even five years old. So, you know, like, there's that <laughs> factor as well. Some students just get shy, um, which makes sense. So you've seen uh, this before. Four, um, I think I just didn't color code it the same way it was done before, but I looked at uh, most of our, most of these are our MSAN partner districts who have dual language programs, uh, almost all of whom have hybrid lottery systems as opposed to the other models. And what you find in the majority of them is that um, Spanish speaking students are prioritized, siblings are often prioritized. Uh, sometimes there's some, some interesting ones like Verona where students of staff members are prioritized, things that uh, I don't think are quite legal in the state of Massachusetts. And the flip side, Arizona, there's no, you're not allowed to have any specific preference in a lottery system in general. It's a fascinating conversation with them last year. Uh, they would like to have a lottery system, but it, it's been declared illegal in the state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have some different state laws and politics going along with that. Uh, but I think for, for districts similar to ours, Chelsea's not an MSAN, but I had a long conversation with them. Uh, a number of districts have a specific number of slots for Spanish speakers just to guarantee or ensure that the composition of the class is, as much as we can, pretty balanced that way between native speakers or students with exposure to Spanish, um, as well as English speakers uh, or other speakers. But we want to make sure we have language models in both languages. Um, so a caveat um, that's an important one is we base these projections on what has come before. We don't know two factors. One, demographic sh patterns change in general. The second is we don't know if demographic patterns will change as a result of this program. It's, it's just impossible to say. One could imagine any sort of, a, a number of um, changes that might happen based on having a program and interest or lack thereof in a program, right? There's a whole, whole number of variables that we can't predict, um, but we just used, when we were doing all this work to pick up uh, the points earlier, we tried to look at the last five years and what are the, if, if that trend held, what would these numbers look like? Um, but I, I, I want to say that caveat's important because we just don't know the impact of having this program on who chooses to be in Fort Rivers District, who chooses to go attend our public schools versus another choice, right? All those things are unknown variables. So the demographic goals of the program is we'd want to have 40 students starting the program and um, at least 16 students English speaking, at least 16 with some exposure to Spanish, at least 10 of the 16 high levels of fluency in Spanish. And just to be really clear, because I already got this feedback, you know, so 16 and 16 is 32, right? It's not 40. And the idea is that we'd want to have some flexibility. You know, we don't think in this community, you know, with the demographics we have, we want to say 22 of this, 18 of that. We want to have some level of uh, depends on who applies. Um, and we're still open to feedback on this. I've already gotten some feedback. Why only 16? Why wouldn't you increase that number? And if you don't get it, then okay. And, and that's the kind of feedback that we, I would look, and I think we would look, look for. But we wanted to promote some level of <coughs> flexibility because we, uh, I think, we get too prescriptive and there might be some unintended consequences that we don't want to um, have. And Dr. Morris, yeah. just to clarify too, yeah. I think we've talked about the flexibility that we're going to build, and this is the very first year, right? Yeah. And so there's, you know, a, a high probability that this program will end up changing in the next, you know, couple of years, right? And as we learn more about yeah. how these things are changing in the community and how the community is responding and how successful the program is or isn't, we will be adapting to that. And I think if we, if we if if everything we're saying tonight is exactly the same three years from now, we've done something wrong. <laughs> I mean, just to be very blunt about it, because every program you speak to, I mean, Cambridge being the best example because it's the oldest, they're continually changing. And they actually, 
I think worth noting is there, as a district, they changed their controlled choice model for f five years ago. And not because of the dual language school, but because of, you know, other reasons that Cambridge changed. And it significantly influenced mm -hmm. who attends that school to the point where they had to change their academic program model because um, they were getting less Spanish-speaking students, less students with Spanish exposure in their lives, having nothing to do with dual language. or that, But it just, again, when you have, like, ever many elementary schools and you change this massive controlled choice model, the results had all these consequences and they've had to make an adaptation. So even the most kind of veteran or mature program continually has to adapt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Dumley? Uh, the only other thought I had on, on setting minimums, and I don't have really an opinion as to whether this particular number is the right minimum or not, is, is just thinking about that you have one grade for entry level and that you're talking about uh, a seven-year program, and so you have to think about attrition. Yeah. So, so you really want to mark these off at what's, what's the minimum that you want for quality program at grade six, right. subtract potential attrition, and then what number do you get to, right? right. So in other words, you, we want to sort of bake in a certain amount of loss, mm -hmm. um, not because the program's failing, people move and such, but you know, attrition, some level of attrition can't be failed. Yeah, and, and so two thoughts on the attrition piece. One is that, you know, every district that we've seen or spoken to asks for, and you can't guarantee this, but a commitment that families who are registering plan to be in the community uh, for five years. Not because it's like we want to hook them in or people can't leave if it's not working for, they don't perceive it working for their child, but because the benefits really play out if you're in the program for at least five years and, you know, we don't want to have kids you know, who are planning to leave after a year, it's probably not the best program for them, not because it's not wonderful, but it, it, they're not likely to go to another dual language school um, afterwards and then we're setting them up. I think in the larger piece, uh, what we've, what I've heard is that uh, with the attrition piece, the what often happens is they're replaced by students coming in who are Spanish-speaking ELL students because they're the most appropriate. So mm -hmm. even if we're not at 16, um, when, when there's attrition, the replacement after a certain point, which will be a future conversation, can't be monolingual English students because developmentally they're not, it's not appropriate to jump in at third grade. So really the replacements will be Spanish-speaking ELL students or English learners. So I'm trying to get that language now that it's more clarified in the literature um, cleaner, so I have to watch myself on that. Um, so I think it, it does balance that way, and, and but one of the questions I'm getting is why wouldn't you shoot for 50-50? And one of the reasons is just based on averages, we're more likely to lose English speakers just because they're, they move, not because it doesn't work for them, and only have the option of replacing them with Spanish-speaking English learners. So you, we have thought through mm -hmm. some of that, and we'll have to see how it goes and what this community's experience is, but trying to learn from other communities, um, that's, what, that's how we're thinking about it. Thank you. So just enrollment process. Um, thank you, Ms. Warsmoreland, for this visual. Mine was much less clear, so uh, I just want to note that this is a team effort. Um, so we would have Fort River Kindergarten enrollment registrations. That typically is in late March. Um, and ask families to express a preference about the dual language program, and that with parent education along the way. I'd, you know, this is more like the nuts and bolts of when people make choices. There'd be lots of education um, to the conversation earlier before we get there. Um, kindergarten screening is typically an early, um, early, excuse me, I skipped one. So all families would express a preference about the dual language program, not just Fort River families. Fort River families, it's a little different process I'll get into in a second, but we'd ask if you're registering your child for Wildwood and you have an interest, it's good to know that when their child registered. Um, when your child would, would be registered, excuse me. We do those screenings, um, and at that point, first of all, we may get some more information about language proficiency, both in English and Spanish, from that population. Again, we have the parent screener where parents are self-identifying, but uh, when any student identifies that they speak a language that's, you know, their first language is in English, you know, the ELL team does an assessment and assesses their, uh, as best we can, their first language skills as well. Um, and at that point, we'd be asking for a decision in the Fort River families um, about entering the program or not. Um, again, the nomenclature, as Ms. Chamberlain said, we want to get better about entering the program or not, or which program they're entering. You know, we're, we're working on that, but we really want families to be included in the decision-making on the nomenclature. <coughs> and at that point, we then have um, two lotteries. Um, and the lottery, you know, that the students from Crocker Farm and from Wildwood uh, would be in lotteries. And the first lottery would be Spanish-speaking students, students with Spanish-speaking ex exposure to make sure we get to our number of 16, mm -hmm. as it currently reads. Once we get to that number, 
then all the students in the lottery would be just com combined into one lottery, and then we'd fill out the rest of the roster. So it wouldn't be like we get to 16, we don't accept one more Spanish-speaking student. It's just that we, I'm not worried about having English-speaking students and a quantity of English-speaking students or English models, given our demographics. Um, so it wouldn't preclude Spanish-speaking students or English learners from making the general lottery, but we would just want to make sure that we get our Spanish numbers up, Spanish-speaking numbers up high enough. Um, and you know, we'd, what you'll see in the next slide is we try to fill to 36 <coughs> because we know, based on past experience, that we have families who register in the summer and some of those families um, at Fort River and some of those families, based on past experience, will be Spanish-speaking. So we don't want Spanish-speaking families who are going to attend Fort River to not have access. I mean, at some point, if you register, family registers on August 22nd, it may not be able to accommodate, you know, in a reasonable way. But we, we know we have late registrants. We, we, every single year, we know we have roughly 10 students register after screening. And we want to make sure that we're leaving a little bit of space for Fort River families who do that. Um, so, yeah. Dr. Morris, just yeah. a clarifying yeah. point. Yeah, so on the lotteries, again, because uh, I know a lot of people are going to be paying very special attention to this. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the first one is Spanish-speaking students, you said. Yeah. Is that across all three schools or just... Can you clarify which, which population? Sure. So there's no, I'm not anticipating a lottery for Fort River families in general. So the lottery, when we when I'm saying lottery, I'm really referring to families who are living in the catchment areas of Wildwood and Crocker Farm. Um, and and uh, maybe in the next iteration of this slide deck, I would put this slide after the next two slides. Oh. Yeah. So similar question. Yeah. Um, what happens at step two if you end up with too many or too few of, of either language in that want to be into the in the program. So if I can go forward a slide or two, I think I'll be able to better explain it, providing a little context. And if I don't, then please let's come back to that, Great. if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So typically during our screening period or um, registering period, about twenty-five to thirty students, thirty being kind of students who register before screening. Um, before that May time, and that's been over the last five years. Um, and this model would have all of the families would have the option of participating in the dual language programs or staying at Fort River in a classroom taught solely in English. And based on other districts that tell us, they say about two-thirds to three-quarters. I use the higher number based on what I'm hearing in the community, but I may be, uh, that may be a mistake. But roughly two-thirds to three-quarters of families with the option choose to enter into a dual language program. And, and so, you know, my first reaction to that was surprise, given the level of enthusiasm. And what we heard from other districts was, everyone's enthusiastic, and then you get to the place to the conversation we had earlier, uh, my child might, the English acquisition skills might not be acquired as quickly. And there are all the other kind of very real concerns, I'm not minimizing them at all, come up for families. And I think it's entirely possible that families can be incredibly <coughs> supportive. I think it's true. Families can be incredibly supportive of the implementation of a program while not feeling like they necessarily want their child to be a part of it. And the other thing that I heard in every district is the first year is a lower yield. And then over time, that yield gets higher and higher. So they said, don't, don't be frustrated or disappointed if you're expecting like 80% in the first year, you get 60%. Because the first year of anything, especially something that really is a seven year period that most of us don't have exposure to, um, can be really daunting things for families mm -hmm. to make that decision. Um, so the 75%, I think, in, again, a future iteration, I may downgrade that a little bit um, to what I heard, which is more two thirds to three quarters. And again, starting, sometimes starting on the lower end of that in the first year or two of implementation, then rising as the program becomes more established. So now I'm going to get more specifically to, to Ms. McDonald's question. Um, so the lottery is for non-Fort River families living in Amherst. Um, so for the remaining slots, families who register their children for kindergarten would be, you know, <coughs> allowed to enter a lottery, and then we'd divide the define the lottery into two groups, one students with Spanish language skills, students with Spanish without language skills. And we try to go to that threshold of 16, again, with 10 with high levels of Spanish fluency. So in terms of if we didn't get there, what would we do? There's plenty of programs that don't have that number of, you know, getting closer to a half. And uh, we would continue the, one of the questions I'd have is why didn't we get there? Is it a weird year where we just have low numbers of students with Spanish background? Or was our outreach <coughs> efforts not sufficient where families with Spanish as their first language either knew about the program, understood um, some of the benefits, 
or we're able to ask questions and feel more comfortable with it. Um, so I'm sorry to answer your question with more questions, but for us, it would say, is this a, a, an odd demographic here that doesn't fit the pattern? Or is there something about our outreach that hasn't, hasn't gotten to the families, uh, some of our target audience? To me, it's not a deal breaker. It's not like, oh, we get to 14, we're not doing it. Um, Cause there's plenty like some of those ones like Millis and Milton, right? They're at 0% native speakers are, are very close to it and they have successful programs, but it would be, I think disappointing if our yield was lower because of um, outreach efforts and, and we would redouble those. Um, I think if we had more than 16 or if like, you know, the lottery, the general mm -hmm. lottery just yielded so many Spanish speakers, the reality for our Spanish speaking population in Amherst is many of our Spanish speaking students come in with some English, foundational English skills. We don't have a population um, in huge quantities that come to kindergarten speaking no English or not having English exposure. And some of that's just the fact of preschools, right? And preschools in the area, they're almost, uh, I can't think of one where there's a heavy emphasis on Spanish. I mean, Head Start definitely has people who speak bilingually um, and the community action one. And so the majority of our L's, our, our, our English learners come in with some capacity. So if we were at like just a random lottery and we ended up with 22 or 25 students with background in Spanish, I would have no concerns at all. Actually, I think that would be wonderful. But you know, I'm not sure we can guarantee that. But um, if we were in a different community that had a higher rate of direct <coughs> immigration, um, th I might feel differently about it. But that's you know our experience in our community. I'm just looking at Ms. Richardson of how many level one ELL students we have in any given grade level in, in an average kindergarten grade, and it's certainly not double digits that I can think of um, at one particular school. Um, so. I don't know, that makes me feel more comfortable. Um, and as I said, the 36 is the number we're trying to target, knowing that we have late enrollees and we want to uh, be conscious and cognizant that we want to leave a little space. Um, and certainly if we didn't fill that, like if it's an odd year and no one enrolled late, then we have that lottery we can go back to as well. Um, but that's sort of the thinking at the moment. Thank you. Um, Ms. McDonald? <coughs> so this what happens in the situation that you don't, I mean, it doesn't seem likely, but yeah. like what, you know, <laughs> you want to understand sort of what your plan B if it does happen, if you don't have enough, if we didn't have enough to, um, from the Fort River families that, that went in, that were interested in the dual language program, and we end up with more than one classroom of kindergartners that want to be in the English only oh. program. Oh. That is a scenario that was loosely brought up, I think, by someone in the room uh, last week. Um, and, you know, we, we sort of talk loosely about it based on the feedback we're getting. I mean, I want to be cautiously optimistic about that feedback, yeah. but um, we only have, you know, the last couple of years, the average is 40 students. So to have more than 20 students choose to be, which we'll get into, we actually want that class to be a little less than 20, uh, but to have that many students opt out it just it, mm -hmm. it seems unlikely and mm -hmm. i think we'd have to reevaluate things you know but we would know ahead of time right so we would get a good sense of that in march and april uh and then be able to reconsider our approach um it wouldn't be like we'd find that out in mid-august right, right. yeah but no it, it has been raised um but i think it's a good point to to raise again i think i already went over this orally um so transportation um they're incredibly flexible, our transportation department. I want to say that publicly and uh, thank I'm them. Sorry, Dr. Morris, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I know this is a long presentation, but it's <coughs> important. If you could back up one slide. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, Another one? Okay, maybe two slides. The okay. one that says lotteries for non-Fort River yeah. families living in Amherst. Yeah, so this is the slide that I think people are going to be, <laughs> these crock farm and wildwood parents and young children are going to want to be looking at. So, so just because I know this, a lot of this content was talked to two slides prior. Uh -huh. But essentially, yeah, I'm if I'm reading this correctly, um, after the Fort River enrollment <coughs> happens, then there's a lottery for interested Fort River, I'm sorry, interested Wildwood and Crocker families. Um, first with a priority on students with Spanish language skills, you hit that level, and then there's a second lottery with everyone else until you fill it. Is that That's a fair it. summary? It is. Okay. Okay. And if you, anyone can think of a more succinct way to put that on paper, I'm really open to <laughs> feedback on that. I was really struggling with how to describe a complex process more simply. So it might be the visual and adding more context to that visual that I started with, that might be the better way to approach it instead of adding more text to yeah. slides. But any, like, not right now necessarily, but anytime if people have thoughts, I wanna make sure that we are able to describe it in a way that everyone can understand. Great, thank you. 
Um, transportation, so, um, you know, working with our transportation department, being conscious that we don't, we're not working from a place of abundance in terms of res financial resources. Um, the way that we can do it is that students would take their bus to their neighborhood school while they're at Crocker Farm and then take a bus or a van from there to Fort River and the reverse would occur in the afternoon. There are some downsides to this. It's, it is more time in the bus um, and that, you know, this is currently a model for specialized programs and sometimes it means five minutes before the bell, kids have to get on a bus to get to their other site because they have to do it. It's not a huge imposition on our transportation department because um, the buses, particularly for Crocker Farm, they have to drive past Fort River to either way anyway. Uh, and for Wildwood, it's all of 1.8 miles away or something like that. Um, so it would be an increase in the routes. So about eight minutes more on a bus for Crocker Farm students, about four minutes for Wildwood students. But there also will be some delay of like when you get to Wild a student gets to Wildwood, they're then waiting for the bus that has all the students who are then going to drive to Fort River. So it is an increase in, in time. I want to be clear about that from the beginning. Um, but it's the only fiscally feasible way to provide full access to students without creating uh, a minimized transportation system where we like have we, the other one we looked at is like what if there were pods like families get their child to x spot and we have pickups that are different than our current one but we came back to the equity question of not every family can get their child to that place um <coughs> and some students uh what makes me feel a bit better is that some students have a more direct route to fort river particularly in the area of east hadley road which is already cut up in uh in three as you remember from the enrollment map earlier because uh, we already have buses going from East Hadley Road to all three elementary schools, and our transportation department is really excited, actually, to not have that. So if there's a bus literally on the um, in your neighborhood that's going to Fort River, you wouldn't then have to go first to Wildwood, then take a like a commuter line to, to Fort River. You would take the direct route, which actually would reduce the time on a bus for many students living on East Hadley Road, at least those going to Wildwood. Um, so this is you know what we're able to do given fiscal constraints without adding... You know, each bus run costs fifty-five thousand dollars. So, you know, that's the variable that's at play. If we started having extra bus runs going all over town, uh, the costs start adding up very quickly. And also, I mean, it, obviously, a lot of parents choose to take their children to yes. school, right? So we can anticipate that that would be the case in this scenario as well. Yeah, which is actually <laughs> something we have to just about um, bus, uh, car traffic at Fort River to be thoughtful because I, I do think there'll be an uptick of families driving their children to school. We've already seen that with school choice. Since mm -hmm. the district's implemented school choice, we've seen an uptick in car traffic, which is logical since we're saying you can only come to the school if you drive them. Um, uh, but we imagine we'll have a little more in this this model, this scenario. Mr. Demley? Yeah, I, th I think it's worth noting that, you know, the, our, the fact that this can be done um, in a relatively cost-neutral way is, is kind of serendipitous based on the structure of our busing, which is based on our enrollment zones. I mean, we talk about the islands and the problems of the islands, you know, and, right. and that's a complicated topic, but it just so happens that that facilitates this. I, I'm, I was sort of looking at some of the simpler enrollment zone maps and, and wondering, you know, you know, rewind history, if we had really simple enrollment zones, I'm not sure we could do this in a cost-neutral way yeah. uh, that was equitable. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting because it, the whole thing could have blown up over this, I yeah. think. And... Um, you know, I, 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 not to get too into the weeds, you know, I, I don't think this is 100% ideal, but it's, it's, it's a lot better than, it, than other cost-neutral options are. I think that's right, and I think it's also the thing I'll emphasize is it's a choice families are making, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't want to minimize that more time in a bus is challenging, but no one is being forced to enter the program. No one's being forced to enter a lottery to get into the program. So if that's part of the deal. If this is something that's valuable to a family, then there's some cost benefits that are made just going to a school that's not in the neighborhood, right? Something that's not about transportation, but it means that neighbors may not be at Fort River with you, and that may be a factor that families have to weigh about, you know, what, what, what do they value more? Um, <coughs> and this is just another factor that I think has to be in that pot for families. But I'd want to be explicit from the beginning instead of families not knowing it'll be more time in a bus. It's going to be more time in a bus. Um, Entry into dual language program beyond the kindergarten year, if space allows. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, because it came up in context, that um, seems like if there's space, it's a fantastic program for students who are coming either as Spanish language, as English language learner with Spanish background, uh, or students who have skills in both languages. Um, for monolingual speakers, some districts allow for first grade entry if there's space allowed, and not after that, uh, but just developmentally acquiring a language as 
kind of many of us who are mostly monolingual will attest to, <coughs> gets more challenging as students uh, advance, and particularly as the other students have had multiple years learning bilingually, um, the entry point is a really difficult one for students developmentally and not recommended by Mabe and, and other districts we spoke to. I think my last slide, I don't have a nice summarizing one like Ms. Chamberlain and Ms. Richardson, um, is that sibling preference. So one of the things that came up is what about current or future kindergarten students, like let's say for next year, who have older siblings, could the older siblings take the same transportation? And I looked with Ms. Chamberlain at the class sizes of the upper grade students and all of the class sizes are pretty maxed. Um, and so we didn't necessarily feel like we could open that up as, can, as much as we'd understand families' interest in having siblings in the same school. Um, we didn't feel like we could open that up with the current class sizes. We'd, we'd probably have to add cost of adding another section, and, and that's, that would be a challenging thing to do. But I think sibling pre preference moving forward for younger students, uh, we'd want to make sure we're integrated into future enrollment policies. Um, and, you know, I was fully, we had talked about this a lot in the summer. And I think there was broad support for it on the committee and with myself. And uh, it was interesting because when we were in Virginia, they were very cautious that um, y the overriding preference has to be the right mix of students and their language skills and not siblings. And for some districts who have put siblings on the same level as Spanish language preference, they've ended up actually reducing the numbers of Spanish-speaking students in the program. So I think I, I'm not seeing this as a conversation we need to nail tonight because um, I don't think it's going to be relevant for at least two years. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I take that caution seriously that the, the most important thing for the academic program is, is the demographic mix of students that's going to contribute to it. And I see siblings as really important, but probably one notch below that in terms of importance. Um, because I think if we guarantee siblings and it ends up that we have, um, we're reducing the number of Spanish-speaking students who get into the program based on that, you know, that's not going to feel great to me, and I think it's not going to be in the best interest of the program. So that's that's where I'm sort of sitting on siblings right now, but looking at class sizes at Fort River, there's just, there's not the space to accommodate older students for <coughs> 2019 joining a potential kindergartner um, at Fort River as much as families might love that, even if they're not in the dual language program, just because they heard wonderful things about Fort River or siblings in the same place. It's just not something we're able to accommodate. So I think just to, to restate that, a key yeah. takeaway for families is that uh, siblings, you know, may have some kind of preferred status, just not in the beginning year, yeah. and possibly in a couple of years once we have a better sense of how things are shaking out with the program. Right, but it wouldn't necessarily be a guaranteed right. status. Um, some schools do sort of set that up um, in general, like sibling preference is guaranteed, and, and the caution is there might be unintended consequences to that. Yeah. Any comments, Mr. Dunley? Yeah, just, um, so I don't want to get way into that now, yeah. but when I when I go through the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> and I think about like what are some conversations we should have further before we like vote, that seems to be a pretty big one in terms of like I understand the class size with the older siblings currently, right? Um, but in terms of like making the plunge to enroll your child in a new program when you have even younger children, and then not being guaranteed that those children would be able to, right? You know, it's like it's like we're asking them to make kind not a not a contract, but a commitment yeah. to us to be in the program. And so I'm seeing, I mean, I'm understanding your points, but I'm just seeing the tension there mm -hmm. in terms of what we can and can't, what we ought not to guarantee or not for, for families that are willing to sort of make a certain level of commitment to the district. So mm -hmm. um, not, a, not a final discussion, but I just want to put a pin in it. <laughs> no, I think, if I can comment, I think that's the tension point right there. Um, you know, and some districts, I think, are trying to have English-speaking um, families or Spanish families with English-speaking students, um, the sibling piece would take them to the top of that lottery, but not necessarily surpass the demographic piece of language skills. And, and that actually uh, it doesn't resolve the tension point you mentioned, Mr. Demling, but I think it, to me it sounds like a logical next step of, yes, we're prioritizing siblings and not at the risk of um, turning the program's demographics um, into a primarily monolingual um, setting, which just, it's just not that anyone's intention would be that, but that could be an unintended consequence. Um, so thank you for presenting this, and I think it's nice to, like we've all put a lot of work into this over the summer, and um, I think no matter how we do this, there are going to be people <laughs> who are not going to be happy. Um, and so, you know, uh, being the data-minded person I am, I started an Excel spreadsheet and I was like thinking, oh, so what is the probability that my monolingual English-speaking preschooler 
lives in the Wildwood District is going to probably get in. And if I look at the numbers, and, and I wanted one question, I was just thinking about, does that number 30 kind of reflect choice students when you talk about enrollment? So these are the 30 kids who currently live in the Fort River District and are enrolled. So then it looks like to me, like if we took that 75% probability, you know, of, you know, if we take the highest numbers, the 30 kids, Fort River families, and we take 75% of them are probably not monolingual, meaning because that 25%, right. mm -hmm. and then I, from that, that take 75% of those kids might be interested, then there are no lottery slots for Eng monolingual English speakers in the classroom. So I think it's not that there's anything wrong with that, mm -hmm. but I think we're going out and talking to the community as right. though there is some hope for the Crocker Fair. And, and there is, like maybe you'd be one out of like 20, or, you know, because like you said, there are all of these like, who knows, you know, like these unknown data points. But I think the issue is just that like, for the number of Wildwood and um, Crocker Farm families I've talked to, there's who are like myself, and I'm not saying we should be designing this program to meet my needs. <laughs> and I'm just thinking about when we communicate. Design the program to meet Carrie's. Yeah, I'm just thinking about when we communicate this. Like right. people are so excited about it, right. and I think we might want to try to tamp down some of that excitement because it's going to be really. Like, it's very likely that kids, you know monolingual English-speaking families outside of the Fort River District have zero probability of getting into any of these spots. I don't know if maybe I'm interpreting the numbers wrong, but that was my, like, um, back-of-the-envelope calculations. Right. And um, it's just taking a... And I guess this is also... I'm so excited about it, and it's the one, like, silver lining when we go out and talk to people, and it's not about... Like, it, we've had a lot of negative things coming up for recently in regards to, like, our school's physical c c conditions and stuff. So I'm not saying this to be a downer about the program. I'm really excited about it. But I think it is hard to go out with all this energy focused on this one program in one of our schools that a limited number of kids outside of the, the Fort River area are going to get excited about. So hopefully after November 5th and we voted, we can put a little energy into getting excited about some of the things going on in the other schools. And also just to try to, I don't know how to do this properly in our communications, but to try to have some communication about the fact that this is really focusing on the Spanish-speaking kids in our district who are right now needing to be served, um, who are underserved, and, and we, we, we are consciously trying to reach them in our communication about that, and then also that this is really focused on the kids who are living in Fort River. Yeah, so maybe after, not after, literally yeah. after, because I imagine you'll want to get home, but um, <laughs> we could connect, because my math shows there's not a huge number of monolinguals, but... Okay, so maybe so, I'm doing it wrong. Right. I'd love well, to be wrong. I'm not suggesting that you, there's no right wrong. Oh, well, there is, but I'm not suggesting it's based on personality. or, <laughs> yeah. or but, um, but I think the larger point you're making, I think, is really accurate. And one of the things, coming back from Harrisonburg, that was the most salient, other than like seeing the classrooms, was they're harped on the fact that we need to continue to talk about what you just said. The program is primarily being designed to support Spanish ling speaking English learners, and we think there there needs to be English language models as well, but that's our focus. And they said the schools, because they have it in multiple schools, the schools mm -hmm. that said that from the beginning, it went much much smoother than the schools that did not. Mm -hmm. They have similar demographics to us, um, more Spanish speaking students, um, but in a, in an overall rough sense similar. Um, and I think it's a really a point well taken about the messaging um, around. The program and and so I think when we went out in the community we were incredibly explicit about that in every preschool visit um, as well as the Fort River Coffee with the principal that that was I mean what I just said we yeah. said to everyone who came but not everyone came right so I mean it was whatever maybe a total of 70 75 people but that there's a lot more than that who may have questions or be interested and so I think your point's well taken I do think Mr. Donez and I've shared this with Mr. Donez and Mr. Demling's column in the bulletin also was helpful because I think it, it the paragraph about supporting English language learners was above the paragraph about, right, so that wasn't, I imagine, by accident that it was um, <laughs> written that way. And, you know, what the people in Harrisonburg said, you can't say it enough. Every single meeting, every single slide deck, make sure you're including some language around the fact that, that that's the audience. But the math we should talk about. Yeah, and I'd also just say that... Um, even if, if I'm wrong about the math, I mean, we're not... We're not maybe, talking about like, huge five numbers. Kids yeah, yeah. Kids outside, so it's still... I can probably say, like, no matter what, it's... We're not designing this program for the entire um, 
monolingual English speaking community in yeah. Forest and it's and I think also messaging that it's not in reaction to um, the Chinese immersion program because a lot of mm. people frame this as that yep. yeah. and it's not and, and it shouldn't be, it be um, but I think you know because the, 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 the populations that are going to that program are different than the population that we're targeting with this program but I think sometimes people view it as, at least when I talk to people they've come up and say oh we missed this opportunity in the past to do the immersion and now we're finally catching up and it's but it's different it's 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 really different from that program and I think it's good to make sure we message it appropriately and, and I think uh, just to pick up on that point which is an excellent point um, you know there there is a lot of excitement about this program as a potential benefit, right, to monolingual English-speaking students, and it is. And I think that the way that Ms. Chamberlain and Ms. Richardson, um, you know, characterized a program that also allows for Spanish language, um, you know, exposure, I guess, is, is the right, uh, you know, term, during the normal school day, even for students that are not actually in a Sp Spanish language, uh, dual language classroom, um, that that's a benefit as well, because it doesn't currently exist, right? So for older students, potentially, you know, who are not in those dual language classrooms, they still are benefiting from that other, that Spanish language, you know, that, that they're hearing on a daily basis. And kids are kids, they will pick up language from each other, they'll, you know, there's going to be that kind of conversation and curiosity and all of that. And the addition of bilingual staff also who will presumably speak in Spanish, you know, here and there, and, and people, will, you know, students will pick that up. But at the same time, this is a very different program from the, you know, uh, other, you know, opportunities that exist in the community for language uh, instruction. And so I think that, you know, it is about uh, perhaps communicating, you know, about changing demographics in our communities, right? It's about talking about, you know, uh, again, sort of social equity and social justice principles and goals. Um, and it's not just about the dual language, you know, uh, exposure and acquisition, but it really is more yeah. about these other things in concert with a dual language. And it is something that is a struggle because, you know, as, as again, Ms. Chamberlain, Ms. Richardson pointed out previously, uh, our expectation is that we have this monolingual English instruction that happens on a regular basis and it's, you know, it's our right, you know, and this is a language that, that is a dominant language in, in our country right now. Um, but that's changing. And so, you know, we're, I think with a program like this, at least opening up the conversation for the possibility that we are willing to consider other forms of instruction and education, not just consider them, but also prioritize them because we recognize that they are of benefit to other members of our community who have not previously benefited from, you know, that, that kind of instruction. Um, but it is going to be, I think, a challenge for a lot of families who have been super excited about this, you know, and see this as a way for their, their children to learn Spanish. And uh, it both is and isn't, you know. And so I think as, as long as we can continue to talk about that, about those social justice benefits yeah. and social equity benefits, um, talk about those changing demographics and explain that we have some some loftier goals per se than just teaching children a second language mm -hmm. um that that's you know hopefully the benefit that they're getting yeah and i just i want to also go back to the mission statement that was developed by the fort river um by the leadership group um and miss chamberlain for, and and miss richardson facilitate which sort of emphasize those pieces um not that the mission statement is necessarily what people read, but the reason was on the kind of quick brochure we did for the preschool access, and we'll continue to come back to it because it's it's really about what we want for our students long term, and, and it really does include the social justice elements that is really important. And we heard that feedback from the community very clearly when we went to the preschool, um, particularly from the community that has Spanish language background. Yeah. Well, one thing too that I would yeah. say, just on, on the flip to that, I think you know there we may get. Uh, some concern expressed from from people once they realize that this is not the program that they necessarily thought it was um, and who may think that we are putting a lot of extra resources and extra time into changing a school and a district curriculum significantly uh, for the benefit of you know, a, f a fewer number of children or a fewer number of students. And, you know, I don't believe that. And I don't think, you know, if I've heard the committee express itself in that way. But I would expect that there may be some of that kind of, of criticism and concern. 
And so I think it might be helpful to contextualize this in the same way that we contextualize special needs programming. Right. And that we continue to talk about this as a necessary program for all of our students. And I think you have been doing that, and I've heard that from, you know, from the, the folks who spoke today. Um, but we do need to continue to emphasize that this is another aspect of the work that we have been doing already. Um, and it is going to be of benefit to all students in the same way that inclusion was of benefit to all students. But at the same time, that there is an effort here to really focus some, some resources and attention on a, a significant you know, demographic of our population that has not previously gotten that kind of attention and resources. And growing population. And growing population. You, wish you, you exactly. mentioned that changing demographics before. Yeah. Okay, so um, just in, in interest of the time, I'm going to ask actually if it's okay with the committee that we take a short two minute break um, and five. we come back, I'm sorry? Five. Can we do two? Because it's... Uh, three. It <laughs> <laughs> okay, three. three. Um, it is 8.17, so okay. I'll take a motion um, with the committee's permission. Dr. Morris? I move to take a three minute break. <laughs> thank you. And a second, Mr. Demling? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So we'll take a three minute break. Uh, calling this meeting to order again at 8.23 p.m. Thank you for that little break. Um, so the next item on our agenda is the superintendent goals. So, Dr. Morris, you want to review sure. that? We want to come back to forum planning on this topic of dual language? Oh, uh, I just assumed that we had sort of touched on that, but is there something else that you... you uh, there is. Yeah. Um, so if please, that's okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead, of course. Yeah, so, um, one of the things that we talked about when we met with preschool families in the Fort River Coffee was basically taking these two presentations, condensing them significantly, and reaching out to the community to have forums this month before you know, we would bring back anything, you know, to use that feedback. So the question was um, whether the committee was comfortable, comfortable is not the right word, the committee would, would want us just to proceed as administration in doing that, or would do we want to have them be school committee forums for you to gather feedback? Um, you know, we were thinking one, based on the feedback we got, one morning and one late afternoon was the feedback we got from preschool families. Like, <coughs> evenings seemed really, really complicated for all sorts of reasons, um, for those of you with young children or remembering those days. Um, so we just wanted to get guidance of whether you, the committee would like us to proceed and you, of course, would be invited, you know, but or whether there'd be school committee-specific forums around these two topics. So um, that's the feedback that our team was looking for. I'm looking to the committee to see if there's any, any preferences. Um, Mr. Demling? When you say the two topics, what's the other topic? The zoning and then the curriculum. Oh, oh, oh the dual language. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other question was, I'm sorry to riff, was if these topics bring a lot of families out, is there, you know, what I think we talked about the last meeting, is there an interest we in talked about, yeah, yeah. combining them with other topics? I'm a little concerned. I was really warm to that idea, and... As soon as we started at 6, and it's 825, and <laughs> we've only been talking, you know, I know they'll be stripped down, but the idea is to get more feedback, and um, I'm just getting a little concerned about whether that is advisable or whether that would sort of just be overkill, you know, for the for the for just the people being able to offer feedback. Well, I think that the trade-off, right, is that, you know, either we combine some of these issues or we ask people to come back out again for another forum or another set of issues, and it seems like you know, even though these meetings tend to run a little bit long, um, that having people come back out is, is risky. Like it's not, you know, mm -hmm. parents with young children, uh, there's a whole host of reasons why people can't make it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I think, I guess from, from my perspective, yeah. it probably makes sense for us to try to combine a couple of these issues. We've talked before about the regionalization with Pelham and then also, you know, the, the dual language program. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, open up. Uh, Ms. Patel, Mr. Um, I tend to agree. I, I think that it'll be very long. That said, I do think that we're talking about two, dif oh, two different or overlapping audiences because this dual language, the way you're presenting it or proposing it, is really focused on the preschool families. That's right. So the regionalization would be much broader. Um, audience, so I don't. I, I guess I don't have an answer. I don't have a preference because I could see both ways. It would be very, very long, um, and we would probably just naturally, you know, organically start losing people anyway if we tried to pack them all together. And then I could also see separating it because it might be two different groups of people anyway. I don't know. 
Mr. Dunley. Um, so my kind of instinct is to, is to go uh, one of two extremes. So you either have something that's very specific on dual language, like we're doing dual language. And in that case, I really don't feel like the, at least personally, I don't feel like the school committee needs to be there. I mean, I feel like we've gotten a lot of input over the last X number of months, and that at this point, if there's significantly different input, that Dr. Morris or whoever's running the, um, the forum would be able to convey that back to us, in terms of us marching towards a decision, right? Um, uh, so, so, so I'm comfortable, you know, with a dual language form being like that. Um, on the other hand, I've, I have heard an interesting, we brought this idea up, but I don't know if it was at our last meeting, about the idea of an open-ended school committee forum, where maybe we seed the first five or ten minutes with a run-by about dual language, and maybe a run-by about regionalization, and whatever else is going on at the time, charter school expansions, whatever. Um, and then we open it up for, for any topic. So that, that might get people thinking to ask about those mm -hmm. seeded topics, but they can have a Q&A back and forth about, about anything. And then it's not, you have to come back for whatever topic you happen to be interested in and have a babysitter for, but it's, it's, this is the school committee, we regularly do this now, right? We have these forums where you can, it's not this restricted public comment. That was kind of the, kind of the seed of the idea that I found pretty interesting. Um, in terms of timing though, I think it's a bit of a challenge, particularly in the next like X number of weeks leading up to like town elections and then holidays and such, so you'd really have to pick your spot for something that people would want to come out for, but those are my only two thoughts. Mm -hmm. Ms. Spitzer, do you have any thoughts? I have to put you in the spot. But no, just it's <laughs> okay. No, I'm, I'm, I guess um, <clears throat> I do think that the, the preschool families are going to be particularly interested in this, and, and, but and, and, and what I'd hate to have is a meeting where we end up focusing on a topic that's unique to only half of the people there. And mm -hmm. so one idea would be if we could do it and then, um, well, what's the timeline on the regionalization stuff? Is there a reason we'd have to have a conversation about a forum about the regionalization before like the fifth? <coughs> so really our board is trying to get to a general recommendation by next March-ish. So, um, and we're, so we've been talking about, we met this morning, we were talking more about our our own timeline for having like our own public forums. Um, and that's looking more like um, the very beginning of January and the very beginning of March, where well, I'll sort of get to this later on in the agenda, but yeah, yeah. We're, we're doing like our proactive sort of outreach and engagement with uh, groups and organizations now. And then once that, uh, at what, what point, at the point we have that done and then we have uh, sort of a, a lot of our work from our consultants back, then we sort of come out and we have something to like people to really chew on. Um, so that's the kind of timing there. But, you know, we're trying to talk about it as much as we can throughout. So based on that, I'd say let's focus on the dual language at any upcoming forums and then preview, like stay tuned, we are going to be, this is going to be affecting you and you should plan on coming out again in a couple, I mean like I feel like asking somebody to come back out in a couple of months isn't a big deal, as big a deal as if we were, if, if the timelines overlapped more, I guess. Whereas I feel like we're going to be making a vote on the 5th, so the purpose of this is to get input. You know, we should make it meaty enough that people can come in, t learn about it if they haven't already, and, and really have... I mean, I, I've had parents tell me, I wish I could have come tonight, you know, parents with two-week-old babies say, <laughs> you know, how do I get my feedback to you guys that are making this decision? I can't come tonight. I advise them to write a letter, um, but I think it would probably feel better for them to be able to come and talk to us. Mm -hmm. So um, for those reasons, I'd say I'd like to focus on I'd be happy to attend if my... Like if it were Monday or Tuesday, I could probably do do it during the times you stated. If it's a different day, probably not. But I'd be willing to attend if it's useful for us to be there. Dr. Morris, can I make based on the feedback I'm hearing, <coughs> and I could be hearing the the committee wrong, but um, if I worked with Debbie tomorrow and we just put out some dates, and and they wouldn't necessarily be school committee forums per se, because I think it's gonna be hard to get everyone's schedule the line, but school committee members would be invited. And just to be really clear, I'm thinking of like. 15 slides or less, probably a goal of 10, just to get people, you know, to try to capture the essence of these two presentations. I'm, we're not doing this again. Um, I just want to be really clear. That was special for you all, um, but but not what we do because I think I want things to come up more naturally in, in conversation and discussion, and I think that works better than long presentations. Um, but we'll try to try to look at a couple dates. Um, I'll talk to Ms. Chamberlain, Ms. Richardson, um, try to do one morning again, one late afternoon. Um, We'll try to run them by the committee, seeing if people can come. If people can come, then we probably, I think it's advisable to post, mm -hmm. just because 
otherwise it may be complicating your opportunity to participate. Um, if we don't have a quorum, then there's no harm in that. Um, does that sound like an okay plan forward given timeline? So I, I think um, that sounds fine to me. And I'm looking at the calendar here. We've got you know four weeks before yeah. the next, or the expected vote anyway on this issue. Um, I guess the question for the committee and for, for Dr. Morris to think about is you know whether or not this forum, uh, what the goals really are, because I think there's you know there's a, a question about that we just talked about, which is uh, the the concern that the community might have in response to understanding really what this program will entail. Um, and it also what it won't entail. Right. And so there's an aspect of that that makes me think that, you know, the forum would want to help accomplish a little bit of that, right, is to help inform and educate about the point of it. Um, and then also to get some input and feedback. And so with the former goal, it feels like a wider group of the community might be interested in finding mm -hmm. out um, about this and, you know, may show up with the expectation you know, hearing a rumor, hey, we're going to discuss dual language, you know, come learn more, mm -hmm. uh, they would show up with the expectation that they're going to learn about how their child may be able to benefit from this program. Um, and I think that that still is a goal, and that's still something that we want, but not maybe in the, the same way that there would be that expectation. And so, um, and then for the, the secondary, you know, or the, the latter uh, thing that I mentioned, it's really about getting some of that input or feedback from the, the families that would participate in that first year program, right? Those are the preschool yeah. parents and all of that. So it's, it's kind of mixed, I think, um, what we can expect, you know, for something like this. Um, I just wanted to, to say that because I think that in terms of deciding on an agenda and length and, you know, the content and all of that, that that needs to be taken into consideration, right? Like we almost want to, you know, sort of help explain what this program is up front so that if people show up thinking that it might be something else, that they're, they are notified right away. And then also to provide enough time for there to be a robust Q&A mm -hmm. session so that we really feel like people are understanding, you know. Yeah, and I think the other thing I'd add, so I agree with the two goals that you mentioned, I think a third goal would be dispelling myths, which has already happened. Right. You know, it's related, yes. but I mean, yeah. we've, we've gotten a bunch about family's choice or they don't have a choice and, right. and <clears throat> Fort Rivers totally becoming a dual language school and if you don't want it then you have to provide your own transportation to us. I mean, the, you know, the mm -hmm. rumor mill is wide and, and so the forums have been helpful for narrowing, you know, the scope of what people believe this is and putting clarity on that. Yeah. So I know you sort of mentioned that but I want to put a yeah. perhaps a finer point that even if it's families who are larger community members, they'll then have kind of more accurate information than they might have from reading the bulletin or, you know, other mechanisms. Okay, so it sounds like we have a, a plan forward. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that feedback. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Westmoreland, yeah. for <laughs> helping to coordinate that. Okay, so um, moving on, uh, superintendent goals. <clears throat> yes. So we have a document uh, <coughs> that is immediately following the dual language presentation deck. Mm -hmm. And these came from the conversations, the last two meetings that we've had about budget priorities and uh, superintendent goals. Yeah. Would it be helpful to walk through? Yep. So um, the first goal um, provides social justice professional development with a focus on historically marginalized groups for all staff members and provide an intensive focus on racial equity training for administrators. And so this came from the feedback I heard as well as, frankly, what we were planning to do um, anyway, but those two things aligned, which is a good thing. Um, and, you know, it hits many multiple um, elements from the superintendent evaluation rubric. And again, uh, it's a continuation of work that we've started. Um, it's taking the feedback we got from staff and faculty members last spring about where are we? Uh, what have we learned this year as there's been a more intense focus on this topic? And what do we need for, f for next year? So we're actively planning, for instance, our November 6th um, is a professional development day um, <coughs> based on the feedback from last year. So it's not the same as the goal last year, but I do want to note the connections between last year's goal and, and this year. A second goal, um, I'm just going to be brief and then open up for questions if that's okay. I'm reading it out loud because I feel like it's worthy to, you know, people reading on, following online may not be able to. Perfect, thank um, you. Increase the diversity of the teaching staff by ensuring that new hires in the district represent a higher percentage of persons of color than the current staffing percentages. It's a really hard one to word. Uh, but the idea is that uh, 
we've been doing this the last two years, we want to continue the trend that if our new hires continue to be more, um, have a higher percentage of staff of color, that's pushing our overall percentage up every year, and the bar is then going up every year, and that's, the reality is, you know, we have many, many staff members. To make a huge dent in the percentage in any given year would be terrible because it means lots of people left, which we don't want. Um, but if we continually set our target to be higher and higher each year, every year that target goes up, our staff gets more diverse, and that's a kind of a replicable, sustainable model to diversify our faculty and staff. The third one, um, <coughs> using methods that include broad participation of stakeholders, develop a multi-year school improvement program for each school that articulates the direction and identity of each school. So this is sort of what I referenced before, and not as strategic planning, so we'll have to think about some nomenclature, but that this was referenced earlier in the meeting. Uh, following up on the recommendation of the enrollment working group from last year, um, develop, explore and develop all aspects of a dual language <coughs> program model to be ready for launch 2019-2020 school year if approved. Certainly don't need to spend more time on that one tonight. <laughs> and the second one, develop a strategy to advocate for additional preschool access within the community. So I was pretty intentional in the language um, in that one. And um, I think without foreshadowing too much, is there's definitely a need in the community from, for families, particularly families who are income eligible to have um, preschool options. Um, but I see my role not necessarily just as the superintendent caring about the kids who are in our district, but caring about the kids of the community. And so there may be opportunities to partner with community agencies and, and how to achieve that goal. There were many other recommendations in the Roman Working Group. I just, I can't choose everything, like, yeah. right. Uh, there's, there's millions of things we're working on every moment, and, and these are the ones I wanted to prioritize for goals. The fifth one, which we'll get into later on the agenda, is develop and implement a short-term plan in the current school year to improve the conditions of the physical environment and thus the learning experiences of our students. And the last one is present a medium-term capital plan to address the significant infrastructure issues in our aging school buildings, including issues of mechanical systems and exterior spaces. And so that's, um, just to be put a kind of finer line, this is not the work of the Fort River Feasibility Study. This is really about a capital plan <coughs> draft that we plan to bring with you, which is significantly more details than what you've experienced in the past, for those of you who have been through this a couple of times, because the needs are, are such that, um, I think I'll get into this at a, at a different time, that they're only going to grow if they're not addressed, right? So as significant as they are, and I'm not minimizing them at all, um, <coughs> The short term and the medium term, they're just going to continue to develop as our buildings get, you know, close to 50 years and beyond 50 years. You know, all of our systems are starting to break down. We've had that conversation. And, and what do you do in the absence of a clear funding source to fully replace or renovate those buildings? And that's the plan I plan to bring to you. And we'll have to talk about and how to advocate around that if, if you all agree uh, with the town because the price tag is going to be significantly higher than typical capital plans in the past. So that's what I put together for goals with the references to the superintendent rubric. And again, um, this isn't a vote. This is first draft and any feedback I'm very open to. Mr. Um <clears throat> So I have like four or five comments. So I'll just rapid fire them Please. at you. Yeah. Um, so develop and implement a short-term plan for number five. I, I really like the wording of that. So that's my big smiley face one. Um, <laughs> The, so present a medium-term capital plan. So also very important. I would I would almost want to include present and communicate. So this is awkward wording. Communicate to the community <laughs> a medium-term capital plan because part of it is creating the plan. But the other part is socializing this yeah. and getting people understanding of the reality. <coughs> and while it certainly relates to our long-term infrastructure issues with Wildwood and Fort River, it's it's somewhat separate. Um, and uh, and it's. Uh, has has a large impact in terms of our financial relationship with the town, and so um, to, to me, communicating that is as much of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Demling, I'm yeah. sorry. Can I uh, maybe uh, suggest present and promote? Excellent. You get two smiley faces. This <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for A and B, I like both of those goals. They seem pretty separate. Um, I, I know they are both following up on that enrollment working group, but. Um, they seem large enough to me that, that they don't need to be grouped together, and particularly dual language this year should probably be its own uh, top-level number. Um, on, on number two, increasing the diversity of staff. So this seems like something we should be doing all the time, so I struggle a little bit with how it ought to be put into a goal. Um, you know, this is more about philosophy of goal design, you know, where, 
if you have something that's a top priority, and this is a top priority for us, should it always be called out as a goal? Or if it's something that you expect never to drop off the priority list, which I can't imagine it ever dropping it off the priority list, that we want a diverse staff and teaching force, um, uh, should it always be a goal? I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so I'll just kind of leave it at that. My, my other thought on that goal is, um, so this is kind of focused on the recruitment end of, of achieving that increased diversity. Um, you know, so re retention is the other piece, right. um, which, you know, you've talked a lot about before, and we've, you've done, uh, district has done a lot for, um, but I don't, and I don't know if that makes that goal too big. I just talked about making it small. I don't know if it makes it too big, but whenever I look at diversity, I think about recruitment and retention, mm -hmm. right? And so those are two, two wings. Um, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Can I just, just one brief response on goal two is that as opposed to some of the other goals, I would look at this as a multi-year goal for a couple of reasons. One is that what we're trying to do is, what, what I feel like I'd be trying to do is, because I think it, it plays off your point, um, is that we're setting, setting a norm that we are going to be consistently raising the bar. You know, by, by being successful, the bar gets raised and we're more successful. And, and the second is that, frankly, the artifacts I'm going to have at the end of the year are not going to be satisfying because they're all going to be based on the prior year because our hiring cycle goes. So, you know, as I think about it, to your point of, like, it never moves off, I think it probably should, my opinion is, and I'm the women of the committee, but it should always be on and it should always be a multi-year goal that you're getting routine updates about over time because I think it's not something, to your point, that's going to go away. Um, but I do think it's important to have a goal so that we it makes sure that I'm presenting this and both to you all and to the public and everyone understands the importance that um, of the goal. So that that's at least how I conceptualize it, but it's not written that way, so that's helpful feedback at least for me to think about being more explicit about it being a multi-year goal and, and a little more of the rationale. It's not to disagree with your point, yeah. it's just that that's my thinking about it. Any other thoughts or comments from the committee? No, I thought you did a good job of capturing sort of the conversations. I was I was impressed at it, succinct, and I um, uh, uh, support the suggestions that um, Mr. Deming had. Yeah, those were, those were my thoughts too. Thank you. Uh, I'm generally in favor of all of these. I am in favor of all of these goals. That generally, in there. Um, I guess my only piece of feedback would be. Um, I'm not sure how to say this properly. So, the 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 thing I like about it is it seems like some of these are going to definitely overlap at the region. So hopefully you won't be creating, you know, you can. <laughs> they're they're Mostly, not yes. identical, they, but but at least you know, the, the, the first two I think are things yeah. that obviously mm -hmm. those are going to be across the district um, or districts, um, and hopefully, um, you know, I mean the capital planning those. I think I'd you know. Response to Peter's comment, I think those are also things that we should never have drop off the list, right? <laughs> you know, if we were let those these things drop off the list, that would be a problem too. So I don't think I don't have any issue with having things that should be done every year being on here because I think it's a way of highlighting what's really important to us. And so I guess, um, and I guess with numbers one and two, I'm kind of interested in why um, we're talking about diversity with a focus on. Um, I guess the racial equity seems really important, but I'm wondering if we, I, I just, I'm thinking of like, I just recently read um, an article in the New York Times that was talking about the importance of having teachers who not only match in terms of um, race, but also in gender. Right. So like women are under, uh, overrepresented in teaching and having like a black male teacher is also something that really can benefit, yes. especially black male students. So um, I, I think these are good goals. I'm wondering if they should be able broader but maybe not I, so I would kind of defer to you but just for, that was mm -hmm. the, my only thought while I was reading these is if we would want to put in things like gender gender identity ability um, as something for professional development we had um, and also yeah so I'm just thinking that all of these diversity things there are so many different layers as we all know intersectionality all of this um, but just thinking of the the gender piece especially in terms of the benefit of having male students having male teachers and um, who, I don't know. It may not be worth including here, but it just was something that I was thinking about after reading them. Yeah, I mean, just briefly at the elementary level, you're absolutely right that, you know, our district comparatively does very well, but it's a predominantly female uh, workforce at the elementary level. At secondary, it's a little more mixed, and that's also consistent with um, other districts. I think 
Yeah, I want to think about that one a little bit. Yeah, um, I'm not saying... No, 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 I'm not... <laughs> yeah. Um, and the f- for the first one, I just want to make sure that, you know, with a focus on historically marginalized groups, that's inclusive of a lot of the things oh, you mentioned. Okay, yeah, I mean, with the administrators, we have designed a particular focus on racial equity training. Uh, but in terms of the general staff training, because um, I got an update from Mr. Sheehan and Ms. Cunningham today about that, actually. Workshops, I mean, certainly um, all the groups you mentioned and then some are included in, <coughs> in the workshops and training that we're doing. So I just wanted to say um, I really appreciate the way you've articulated the goals. I think you took the feedback from the committee from the last uh, couple of meetings um, and from the community and have you know put together uh, what feels to me like a very solid list of goals for for the work that you're doing. I also think that just you know to to comment on some of the earlier comments that have been made that the superintendent goals. Um, by association, uh, end up reflecting budget priorities, school committee attention, you know, and a lot of other things, right? And so the wonderful thing about articulating all of our collective goals in, in a document like this is that we're holding ourselves accountable for, you know, how we're doing, right, with all of these different things. So I think articulating that and then following up on it is the most important yeah. piece, right? That's the, the evaluation piece of this, you know, as we take the data that we collect during the course of the year. As I mentioned before, it's not just about the, you know, the documents that you compile at time of evaluation, but it's also leading up to that evaluation. All this work that we're doing here helps to inform, you know, how well we think we're doing. So. You know, with all of that said, I think this is a great uh, document to get us started in, in that uh, direction. And I'm looking forward to, I think if, you know, I, I do believe in the continuation of goals. And so I actually think that maybe with some adjustments next year, we would want to see a continuation of these exact goals, right? Maybe we want to shift a little bit, you know, but it helps us get a better picture of how well we're all doing, including right. you, Dr. Morris. <laughs> Um, if we can continue the same goals, you know, year after year for a number of years, you know, and then and maybe at some point we don't have to worry about this anymore right. and we can move on. But, you know, anyway, thank you very much for this. And so I guess the, um, unless the committee has any other questions or comments, the question for you is what, what's next after this piece? So what I would plan to do is make some revisions based on the feedback and bring it on the 22nd for a potential vote of the committee. Also, again, sharing it beforehand, so if there's any... <coughs> things people notice that they could, but that's our next meeting, and I feel like that's sufficient time for me to make the adjustments based on the feedback. Mr. Dunley? Yeah, I would just make sure to um, get Mr. Nakajima's input offline and maybe updated with, you know, our, our conversation yeah. so he has the most up-to-date yeah. information. Yeah, I will note that he was uh, responsible enough to offer feedback electronically already. So, uh, but you're, it's a point well taken, but yeah. I just want to also note and credit Eric, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Okay. Thank you, and uh, I'm going to move us on. Okay, so next issue is maintenance and custodial update. And I just want to say thank you to the committee uh, community members that are here in the audience who have stuck around with us for the past two hours, <laughs> two plus hours. So, Dr. Morris, just hand that over to you. Sure. So, um, uh, I'm just, I think I'll, I'm not going to read the um, memo, but I just want to update things that have done. So the custodial ha staffing is just about finished and either by Friday or Monday, either this Friday or the following Monday, we'll have increased staffing. And it's particularly focused at Wildwood. You know, we have looked at Fort River and we're in discussions about Fort River's needs as well. But uh, what we're continuing to hear and then literally see is that the needs at Wildwood are greater. And, and some of that may be due to the fact that there weren't, we weren't able to do the full cleaning in the summer because the building was shut down. Um, some of it may be other variables, particularly with the um, wrote an issue as well that, that, you know, some of the feedback we've gotten from Minuteman, which I'll get into in a little bit, is just the importance of the daily cleaning routines, um, how often trash is thrown out during the school day because kids bring in snacks and so not just the cafeteria. Um, so our focus is, is, is not that we're ignoring the other schools, but Wildwood is, is <coughs> the school that we're seeing is the greatest need for that additional staffing support. So likely Friday, if not Friday, and the following Monday, just we have, you know, anytime we hire someone, there's Corey checks, there's fingerprint, there's all the things that we need to do um, to ensure they can start working. But guaranteed by Monday, uh, a week from yesterday, we'll have additional staffing at, at Wildwood, and, and we were still evaluating Fort River and their needs in the transition as well. Um, the head custodian at Wildwood developed a checklist for use by the Wildwood custodial team, which was emailed out to the entire faculty for transparency. Uh, we're still making some edits. It was also shared with all the head custodians across the district who then you know, this is one, I guess, the 
Um, so it always looks for silver linings, and I don't want to minimize the experience, but we're, you know, this experience may improve our cleaning at all the schools because now other head custodians are saying, well, I like this, I don't like that, that needs to be added, and so it's becoming a little more of an iterative document, uh, but it's something that was requested and um, our, appreciate our head custodian taking action. I should note that I've been in, um, particularly Mr. Yaffe and Mr. Russ Savage, who's the head custodian at Wildwood, we've had been in frequent conversations on all of these topics. So while I'm reporting for them, because I didn't ask them to come tonight, certainly they could describe the situation at Wildwood in, in more details than me. But as recently as Friday afternoon, we were in we about a half hour conference call about, you know, just what did Minute Man say? What are some next steps? What's the staffing situation? So. This is all being done with the input and, and feedback of uh, particularly the principal and head custodian, as well as the feedback we continue to get from faculty and staff. The Wildwood head custodian clarified communication protocols. One of the concerns that we had is non-custodial staff was, uh, and this is no critique, it's just what we heard, not just at school committee, but in other places as well, taking, um, taking on custodial tasks that we really want done by custodians and not by non-custodial <coughs> staff members. So. Um, he sent an email to the entire Wildwood staff to clarify the protocols when there's a concern, when there's an issue, uh, how to notify him. He wants to be on top of things right away, and if it doesn't get to him, then um, he can't always know about everything in the building. So that's been clarified um, thanks to his hard work. We've purchased new high-quality HEPA vacuums. I mean, our, our vacuums have HEPA filters and um, bags, but this is full HEPA um, machines for use in the elementary school buildings. They're more efficient, um, I mean, I'm sure elect electrically more efficient, but um, they're more efficient cleaning mechanism um, to use. Um, we'll have custodial teams coming this coming Saturday and the following Saturday to do full sweep deep cleaning of Wildwood and Fort River, and we're looking at Crocker Farm and their needs as well. Uh, but looking at those two schools in particular, again, prioritizing Wildwood above the others, given the condition it's in at the moment, um, it's hard to do that, you know, just when teachers leave and students leave in the afternoon. There's the after school program, or you're there for a weekend day with a team, you can do deep cleaning in a way that just really hard to do. Um, it's basically what happens in the summer, and we didn't have that opportunity this summer because of the boiler exchange and um, the asbestos remedi remediation. So we couldn't do the cleaning that typically happens in the schools um, over the summer, but the weekends is the best time. So we're going to pay some custodial teams over time to come in and do that. Been in very frequent contact with Minuteman, um, who's our licensed integration pest management vendor, and they, they work with most of the area school districts. You know, I think they're very good, but they're also pretty much the game in town in terms of who has a license to be doing this in schools. They've been up site multiple times in recent weeks, twice last week. Um, I wrote this last week, so twice the week before and once last week. And they're going to maintain an infre increased frequency in visits. Their experience is problems like this take two to eight weeks to resolve um, based on what they can do, what, the legal, what they're legally allowed to use in schools. And even at homes, they say typically it takes two to four weeks. It's, it's it's not something that gets eliminated <coughs> immediately. Um, and they've been treating for four weeks, and they feel like the situation is improving and is not resolved to the um, comments that we heard earlier. And that this is a typical flow of experience, that things, um, they don't necessarily solve that quickly, but there's a reduced um, incidence, um, and that's what they're seeing. When they come back, they also log where they've seen it, where staff have reported it, and, and the head custodian met with Minuteman on Friday just about the latest sightings and um, communicating that so that they're getting more accurate information of where to treat. Um, Minuteman also made two recommendations this week um, that we're, see we're already um, using. One is a specific cleaning product for drains um, that we had not been using, but they recommended, so we purchased. And the other one, which is a hard one because we all believe in composting, but they, they feel like the composting program right now is competing with the, what they use for lures, um, for the rodents, and, and so it's actually counter counterbalancing or counteracting their interventions. So we really do believe in composting. It's not a long-term pause or stop, but it is a pause based on their recommendation that they, they feel like they have evidence that it's getting in the way. Um, and so that announcement was made this morning to the Wildwood faculty uh, around the composting. So we're just going to stop for a little bit, make sure this problem gets resolved, and, and then um, get back to it. We started work. We've been doing a lot of work on the capital plan for FY20. Um, again, much more detailed than those have been typically presented. Um, and this is the point I was raising earlier, that the concern is that if these significant issues aren't dealt with, all the systems interact with one another and the problems will increase rapidly. So that any system that, that 
as trouble affects all the other systems in the school. And one of the challenges custodially is that the quad system makes it very difficult to clean. There's just corners everywhere, which if you talk to anyone who's doing any cleaning, whether it's their home or in a building, corners are not easy places to clean and we sort of maximize them and um, not having the walls, those kind of feltish walls that we have in those schools um, don't are not easy to clean um, as well. So for all sorts of reasons, we're going to have a very detailed, and not just for FY20, I should say it'll have FY20, but also future years included in the capital plan. So you can see we don't expect every problem to be resolved in one fiscal year, but we're trying to prioritize the ones that are most salient and then play that out over the next few years. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps as importantly at all, all these things is that it's um, my, either myself, the head custodian, Mr. Russ Savage, or Principal Yaffe has been communicating consistently with staff and uh, two-way communication, but that these things are happening has been communicated uh, with particularly the Wildwood staff members. I do want to note, that, oh, one Crocker Farm note um, is that um, today I signed a purchase order, I think I mentioned the last time, that, and it was mentioned in public comment last time, that there was a roof issue, uh, and some roof issues, you know, frankly, Mr. Cody, who's here, is consult. Uh, he's a member of our facilities and maintenance team. And some we do need to contract out. So today I signed a purchase order to resolve the issue. Like, you know, Mr. Cody reached out to a vendor to solve a sort of complex roof, particular roof issue at Crocker Farm at the library uh, computer lab issue. So that, you know, that PO has been signed and we'll have the vendor come in to resolve that problem. Um, some of the items don't, but many of the items do have financial implications for the current fiscal year. So I may be coming back to the committee asking uh, for the re request the use of additional school choice funds this year. Uh, I don't feel like it's right to freeze budgets based on facilities issues. It does, feels like it's a double whammy for staff and I don't feel like ethically it's the right thing for me to do. Um, so, you know, that's a slippery slope, right, which we have to be concerned about is making sure that we're not using more choice funds that we're bringing in consistently, otherwise we end up in a structural imbalance. Um, but I do feel like for the current year, um, we have to see how health insurance information comes in. All that becomes live and active to us in this month. So we're just, you know, Sean Mangano and the HR office, they're coming through all that information to get us a better sense of where we're standing at the end of the first quarter. And then I'd come back at the November meeting, one of the two November meetings, with, you know, we feel like we're okay or we feel like we do need to access choice, uh, choice funds to balance the facilities and maintenance costs that we're incurring as, as it looks at the overall budget without doing something like freezing because, you know, last year was a tough budget year too. So I want to be really conscious of the cumulative impact of freezing budgets year after year is, is not one I want to engage in. So that's long-winded. I apologize, but um, that's what we've been working on and that's what we've been up to. Any comments or questions from the committee? I have a few, but I will hold it. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you for this. Um, this is I like this little, this level of detail, particularly in the middle of number six, um, is, is very good. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm still trying to kind of parse my mind around the the break out the number of issues because we got a whole lot of rapid fire, intense, genuine, mm -hmm. qualitative feedback at our last meeting, um, and it wasn't all just about pests. You know, it was, there was heat, there was um, there was um, mildew. Uh, other, other other issues, um, and then trying to parse out the causes of that as to whether it's staffing levels or building age or um, so. I, I think this is still a still little complex. So I definitely at the next couple of meetings, you know, mm -hmm. I don't think we need. I, I'll just speak for myself. I don't need this level of detail every single meeting, but I, I would like to see it updated. Um, so that um, I'm just just a few comments here. Uh, so like number seven, um, that these will. Costs will increase quickly unless actions are taken. So that's that's exactly in line with draft goal number six: present and promote the medium-term <laughs> capital plan. And so it, it's always the case that schools have capital desires and needs, and so do other town departments. And money is always scarce, and so we have this joint capital planning process. And you know, we we advocate and we're sympathetic and empathetic to our fellow departments, and we do what we can to go forward. I feel like this year it's it's doubly, triply hard. So you get your doubly hard because of the issues that we're facing, and so we um, are asking for, for you know, more than average. Uh, it's triply hard because of the government transition, and you know, I think people in town are working really hard to make sure this goes as smoothly as possible. But no one really knows exactly how it's going to go and at what pace of efficiency. And you know, 
Fortunately or unfortunately, that government transition happens right in the middle of the capital planning process. And so we're quickly going to get a council uh, on board, and we're going to want them to be up to speed really, really quickly. And you know, we're, we're also going to be, wanna be understanding that they're going to have a lot of other voices that are going to quickly want their attention. And so how do we make sure that this gets not just the normal level of urgency, but you know, emphasize this year is it? So I think that's a, it's as much of a communications challenge as it is um, you know, just rolling out the spreadsheet and the data that, that, that show the need. So um, whatever we can do on that <laughs> to help you with that, that's, that would be good. And I guess my answer, I'll just close with a question. Um, you'd mentioned you had a conference call with um, Mr. Yaffe and Mr. Savage. I guess I'm just wondering about how um, the people who are in managing the building every day are feeling about this in terms of the pace of improvement. Um, and and also how how staff are feeling, um, how staff are feeling is obviously a spectrum, um, and there's, there's no way to completely quantify that. But I'd be interested in, you know, I have a lot of respect for Mr. Jaffe. I don't know Mr. Savage, but just how they're feeling. The staff is responding to the improvements. So, um, yeah. So I'll start with that. But I have other comments based on other things Mr. Deming said. So, um, so my so I only know what people tell me, which is a limitation uh, given my role, but I do think there's been uh, a genuine appreciation for the level of response um, and also the communication piece. So I think some of the concerns that were being expressed, um, that there was rapid communication back, and I'm not just talking about myself, but Mr. Yaffe, Mr. Russ Savage, um, that things aren't perfect and, and there's acknowledgement that things aren't perfect, but there's also... I think better mechanisms for staff to share concerns with the head custodian, which helps. There's been more information shared about what's actually happening. I think the response around the custodian has been well appreciated. So I don't want to be overly um, rosy about it because I think there's still some significant challenges, but I do think in terms of communication responsiveness, um, the feedback I've gotten from some of the people who made public comments um, at the last meeting has been you know, appreciative, and I appreciate their hanging <coughs> for very uncomfortable um, conditions. I think I didn't include things about the cooling, which was so, a lot of the comments last time because that problem had been fixed. Um, and by fixed, I don't mean like we have air conditioning, but fixed as in it's the same as the other schools in our district where the chillers are now working, which was not the case the first three weeks of school. So I didn't include that because, you know, I wanted to focus more on these topics, not just that it's been cooler, but that problem's been resolved. Uh, I think on the advocacy front, I think I think it'll have to be a partnership because uh, you know, what ends up happening is I'm not an elected official, so I can do my advocacy, but for those who have been to JCPC meetings or those that haven't, um, staff definitely play a certain role, and then it's elected officials doing what they're elected to do, which is advocate for whatever, you know, cause or purpose they're advocating for. So I definitely plan to play a large role, and I've talked to Ms. Faye about that, and I think we have a good partnership and team effort about making clear if people aren't in the town the conditions that our schools are in but I do think there's a, a healthy role and hefty role for the elected officials to play as well because you know that's that's how the, the legislative process works and the budget process works as well Ms. Spitzer? Um, well thank you very much for these updates um, I have a question and you may not have any I'm hoping the answer is no impact, but I'm just, I guess as somebody who who's, knows there's a connection between pests and things like asthma, right. like have we had any reason to be worried that the students are experiencing, especially those with maybe respiratory health issues, are, are kids experiencing any issues related to this? We heard a lot from the staff and I appreciate that, but I'm also, mm -hmm. as a mom, I've yeah. been a while, but <laughs> curious. <laughs> No, I think that's a gr the right question. So um, we did look at attendance data. We didn't see a negative trend for Wildwood compared to other schools in the district. Actually, it was it was in the middle between our three schools so far. So um, that's not the only indication. I mean, mm -hmm. nurses' records and, and things like that would be another one. But I think the other factor is I asked that question explicitly a minute, man. Every time I talk to them, like, is there anything health-related I should be aware of? Are there any? We have kids with all sorts of, you know, health strengths and health challenges and and. Um, their consistent answer has been at this at the level we're seeing they do not have con health concerns about the building, um, and they've they've been really clear with me. We've been in situations where the answer is no. It's not like our constant answer is yes mm -hmm. because 
if it was, then we have an ethical obligation, and this was a legal obligation actually as our, our, our vendor, to let us know. Um, so that we haven't seen evidence in terms of absences, and we haven't seen evidence in terms of, you know, or haven't gotten guidance from our vendor who are licensed to do this work and licensed to know about health risks. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the two things I can share with you. But we have been attuned to that and attentive to it. And, and then related to the cost of this, um, and I'm, I've been toggling between our agenda that's on this list here and then our agenda here, and I have no idea if this is going. But we have the school committee additional funds from the town on uh, as a budget, mm -hmm. uh, as an item here. <clears throat> we haven't discussed it, and it's not like, so I don't want to talk about something that's not on the agenda, but as a potential source of funds as we have this emergent, urgent need and something that we haven't voted on yet. But, but I don't want to go off topic if we're... Yeah, I, I believe it's on the agenda for the next mm -hmm. meeting. It is on the agenda. Yeah. So right. it's been so moved to the 22nd. <clears throat> exactly. Okay, good. I just, just want to make... And, and same thing with the, the Crocker Farm Space Needs, which mm -hmm. is sort of related to mm -hmm. this. I, I wasn't sure if that was also getting moved or if that was... Yeah. We talked about moving that at the last meeting to the okay the yeah. later meeting Great. in October. So, yeah. but because uh, I, I am concerned about these, you know, I I share your concern that we don't want to be asking teachers to deal with these conditions and then on top of it to make cuts to programs that they weren't mm -hmm. anticipating having to make or freeze their budgets. So, um, I just think maybe we should be creative and potentially won't weigh in on that at all about whether or not we should do that. But just note that out there. Yeah. Topic for discussion. Absolutely. <clears throat> so I have a, a few comments, and some of these are, if you know, if it's okay with you, I just want to ask a few questions because I think it's some terrifying yeah. questions yeah. that have been out there um, that are important for us to, to probably all hear the answers to. Um, so one was, I know that there had been a, an interest in uh, from the educators about understanding what the pest management plan actually is. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can specify for the committee, to the extent that you know, right. and what Miniman has shared with you, what's involved. Right. You know, is it is it traps? Is it something else? You know. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> it's primarily um, a couple things, and again, I'm not the expert to describe it in, in as good detail. So it's traps, but it's also tracking uh, what the causes of this are. Um, so they're tracking where there are sightings. Um, and it's about cleaning um, and cleaning mechanisms and then trying to see what the sources are. And so the reason that the drain piece is one and the composting is another is they're noticing that uh, the composting is not just in one place, it's actually in multiple places based on, you know, without getting into to, to, um, significant details. And so they're, they have a log where they track where there are sightings, where there's reported sightings, kind of their, their management of that and the traps and the, the traps work because they also know they can see if the bait's been taken. So that's the way that they're actively tracking, you know, are there mice here? Where are they? You know, what's the condition of them? So, so that's what goes into it. Again, I'm not the most articulate about that, but um, those are there. And the general plan is all public. So like our general um, integrated pest management plan is, is online and I'm certainly I'll put a note to send you all the link, which is not specific helpful. to this problem, but it's just uh, <coughs> the plan that we have more generally, what materials are used. Um, so I'll make sure that that gets out to the committee. That would be helpful. Thank you. And then I guess my other, uh, another question that I had was just about, uh, it's great to hear that the, you know, there's been a checklist developed and that that's been communicated with the educators. I think we saw, you know, a lot of concern from the educators that presented a couple of weeks ago. Um, about what the cleaning actually looked like and, you know, that there was just uh, some, you know, almost, uh, I don't want to say panic, but it felt like yeah. people feeling very uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable what the situation was. So it's great to hear that that's been developed and been shared. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, a checklist like that might be helpful in addition to communicating how and what or, or with whom to talk to if there's a problem in a classroom, in a hallway, in a public space. If there can also be some sort of expectation built into that checklist of, you know, within 24 hours there right. will be a response and a cleanup, right? Yeah. If there's food lingering in a hallway somewhere or in a closet right. and it's unattended and no one is cleaning that up, 
there should be an expectation built in for educators and other staff to understand, you know, this should be cleaned up by this amount of time, right? And, and whether it's, you know, the afternoon or evening schedule that right. happens or the morning or anything like that. So I'm just wondering if that's been considered or discussed in any way, just to make clear, you know, what that, that expectation is of, of our staff. Yeah, so I saw emails where the head custodian said, you know, again, that, that, that within a day piece of if there's food in the cubby area and they know about it, it'll be gone at the end of the day because um, that's when they make the full sweeps. Now, do they see every little nook and crane in the school? No, and that's why they're asking for staff's mm -hmm. help to communicate. You know, I noticed this or this, you know, this happened in my classroom today. Right, we were having snack, a kid knocked something over. Yes, there was a quick cleanup, but actually it needs a little more today because of this thing that happened because they're children, yeah. right, and things happen. Um, so that's what he expressed in the instance of, you know, if there was food left out, then mm -hmm. the 24-hour piece was what he felt like he was able to do or his team was able to do. Okay, great, yeah. great. Um, so just two more quick Please? questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm, you know, in item number five, uh, you mentioned having custodial teams coming to Wildwood on the weekends, you know, sometime this month, right, yeah. to perform these deep cleanings. I'm wondering if that should just be a regular thing, right? Like every right. three months, right. you know, there is this deep cleaning that takes place in, you know, in the school and, and quite possibly not just Wildwood, right. right? Like it's probably, you know, Fort River and Crocker Farm as well. But in order to get us to a, a place where, you know, it feels like we're sort of playing catch up right now, you know, maybe to catch us up, right. we actually need some, you know, extra expenditures in this area. Right. Um, so in addition, in addition to the, you know, the other staff that have been added, if we have some deep clean that takes place on a regular basis, it helps the community understand that this has been taken seriously and that this is actually being addressed. Yeah, so that typically is what happens over school vacations. Mm -hmm. So December vacation, February vacation, and April vacation. Mm -hmm. The problem is it's a long way till December vacation yep. in this particular situation. So uh, at all the schools, that's <coughs> what the custodial staff do. It's not, you know, it's catch up, it's catch up on the deep cleaning um, and so that's how they use their the time over school vacations where there aren't students and staff typically present. At Wildwood, you know, we just didn't feel like we could wait till December. And the situation was... And honestly, I think, Dr. Morris, yeah. I, would, I would argue that given what we've heard from the community and yeah. from our educators, that the other schools can't wait either. Yeah. So I'm wondering if maybe, you know, in addition to Wildwood, that right. we could schedule a deep cleaning mm -hmm. in advance of December. And, you know, I'm looking to the committee because, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the sole voice on this, but I actually feel right. like we heard enough from right. other, you know, building staff and educators right. that it's really not just a Wildwood problem, right? So, you know, it's worth considering um, as, to the extent that, yeah. you know, that we can. Sure. Yeah, no, we'll definitely can take a look at that and see what's possible um, and what the costs are, but I'm not disagreeing with the larger point. Okay, great. Um, and then the last thing was just about, uh, you know, an update. Um, we had discussed a capital plan, you know, so sort of medium term, and I understand that there were some doors that were being replaced. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you can update us on the status. Uh, I understand that Mr. Mangano was going to put out bids and, you know, and it was getting, so if you could just share where we yes. are with that. So, right, so the bids are out. Um, I mean, the RFP is out. Um, I think bids are back, I believe. The 12th is coming to mind, but I, I don't quote me on that because we have other bids coming back on the 12th. But Mr. Cody, Mr. Cody is. Yeah, he would know better than me. So yeah. I'm actually right on that one? Yes, you are. Okay. Yeah. That's a little bit of a surprise, um, but I'm glad you're here. Um, and, you know, again, trying to prioritize what can be done, you know, two to three weeks. Students fail, you know, students and staff can't be in the buildings. Can we kind of earmark a couple of the ones that Mr. Cody was able to fix? Um, you know, more temporarily, um, could that could those be done sooner, and could we have some prioritization as some of the conversation we've had? Yeah. Yeah, we're shooting um, probably February or April vacation. Um, it's going to take at least two weeks to three weeks to complete all 12 doors, frames and all. Um, it can be flexible a little bit, but, you know, again, do they want to do it in the dead of winter? Um, but it's right now it's leaning towards you know spring, and then need be finish it up at the beginning of the, you know when summer uh, recesses. And, and forgive me, just one more yeah, follow up on that. So you know, again, I think, um, and, and you mentioned this yeah. just a moment ago, prioritizing some of those doors that have been a continuous problem through the years, right? You know. Um, 
So I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for us to even tackle one or two of those doors before the time period that you mentioned. Right. They, um, <coughs> the doors that are an issue are actually at Fort River, and I've been and I have addressed um, one door already. I've had a company come in and, and address that door because the way the hinges are set, they're different than Wildwood. So being Fort River, having a, a, a structural issue that's worse than Wildwood, it, I'm, I'm focusing on addressing those doors, that ones that are going to be a problem issue within the next month or two, to have those addressed because it can't wait. At Wildwood, the doors, um, are being addressed as far as hard to open. When the fire department knows to walk around, I address those doors and make sure that's a high priority with me and make sure that's done. So, again, it's a priority, obviously, at both schools. I'm in constant contact with the custodians and making sure that it's being taken care of and having them have their eyes focused, you know, just have that little keen, have the guys walk around once in a while or be in communication with the teachers and let me know if there's an, uh, an issue that they feel that if something's not quite right, you know, don't hesitate to let me know. And, and Mr. Koye, I should apologize, and also to the committee, uh, you know, we have a member of the, the staff here in the audience for, for those of the community that might be watching uh, on video. And normally, this is a little unorthodox. We usually have a person come up to the to the microphone, but that's my fault. I apologize because okay. I should have I should have asked you to come up. Okay. Uh, but it sounds like just to, to recap uh, that you are in Mr. Coy is in conversation with uh, you know multiple members of the staff to address those concerns, and that the the doors that have highest priority were at Fort River and have already been addressed. And so we're working on all that. I appreciate hearing that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Dumling. Can we go back to revisit the deep cleaning at uh, Fort River and Crocker Farm idea a yes. little bit? Um, so so I, I guess before we say, yeah, go ahead and do that, I, I have a few questions. Like, So one would be, what's what's the capital impact? Because I have no idea. <laughs> um, and then two is, is, uh, is Fort River in terms of like, uh, in, in terms of needing a deep clean, uh, you know, I, I'm using this in air quotes because I don't really know what's involved. Yeah. Uh, is, is Fort River in more need of urgent, clear urgent need than Crocker, for example? And then, and then three, what, what are the causal issues at those two schools and, and would they respond to a deep clean? So for example, because we heard a number of different things that, that, that evening, um, you know, pests, heat, mildew, and, uh, and some of these are, have been specific to Wildwood. And so, um, I mean, I'm not saying like we don't want clean schools, right? I just want to be cautious that we're not responding to all of these very important uh, pieces of evidence and saying, okay, well, let's just go and deep clean everything. You know, I want to make sure that like if, if we if we go through if we're asking for that extra effort and resource investment, that it's actually worthwhile. And so, you know, if I if I was going to go about evaluating this, I would want to talk to the head custodians and the principals at Fort River and Crocker and say, well, what what are you seeing on the ground? You know, what what is is, is, is a deep clean going to be beneficial to you? You know, if, if that's the case, then, you know, I think I would be more inclined to say full steam ahead with that, but I think, I, I think I'd want to... So I don't know if you can respond to that now. Sure. So um, I think the conversation's helpful um, to have with in the, in the way that you described, because I, the questions I have, having been in the schools, is, is a deep cleaning helpful, or is it more a deep clean of the univets, or something like that that might be a better use of kind of custodial time? Um, as opposed to the other areas, which did get a deep cleaning in the summer at the other schools in terms of, like, you know, the sinks, that those areas. So I don't know the answer to that question, but I think what I'm committed to is asking the right questions and coming back to you with information that's agreeable to the committee. Yeah. So uh, just to comment on that, I mean, I think that that makes sense. Um, you know, I would argue that given the, the, the pictures that we've seen and, and, you know, what we've heard from educators, not just at Fort River, but at Crocker Farm also, um, that, you know, again, may warrant a, a close examination of what that deep cleaning looks like. And if that hasn't happened, especially because we've had limited custodial staff over the course of the summer um, in all of the buildings, that it's worth considering whether or not we should do that, right, in, you know, in these other buildings. Mr. Dumley, you were going to... Yeah, I was just going to say, um, kind of following up on what you're saying, which is, because I, um, I was just hearing a little bit of, of maybe different 
strategy or tactic in terms, Mr. Daniels, what you're saying and what I was saying, maybe. But, but I think I think we're on the same page in terms of, you know, there's an urgency urgency to address the issues. The issues are probably different building to building, but with relationships. And so if we have, if if we want our custodial staff to commit an extra level of time, attention, energy, money, whatever, um, to to this cleaning focus, what ought it ought it to be, right? And so I, like I'm sure we could just have them immediately go in there on the weekend and, and clean everything. I just wanted the community to be aware that I mean, that's a conversation that I plan to bring up tomorrow night is um, like one of that these plans, I mean, they're all the documents, but um, I didn't want the committee to be surprised to see that, and I'm going to raise the, uh, the question of if we went too far with this, if there's anything else I saw, um, you know, should we loop in maybe even before November 27th, perhaps in an unofficial way, perhaps not, just as some discussion, uh, because that would be a significant changing program to have to add that many spaces. Um, and I, wanted, I, just, so I just want to use this opportunity to make the committee aware of, of that part of the design. And just a, a clarifying question on that. Um, you mentioned the three preschool classrooms. Is this a recommendation that the Fort River Feasibility Study Committee had made to the designers to help to come up with? Um, or where did this originate? Just, uh, I'm confused. I'm sorry. No, um, and, I, and I'll be very candid that um, unfortunately the committee meetings are often planned when I'm missing a meeting, like tomorrow night, for instance, some theoretically we would be at a Cambodian. There's a group working on the Cambodian experience in Amherst that I'm slated to be at, so I, I've not, my attendance has not been as strong as I'd like, but um, my sense is that, you know, that there is some lack of clarity that we want to preschool access, and um, but I think there's some lack of clarity even among the group about where that, how that came to be. But I, you know, since I, I try to watch catch the meetings on video, but I'm not perfect about the viewing of them, but um, now that we're getting to see plans and designs, I feel like, you know, it sort of stuck out to me, not good or bad, but just stuck out to me as something that this committee would want to be involved in discussions in. So that's why I'm highlighting it. No, there's no critique involved at all, just to be really clear, but um, I didn't want a public meeting tomorrow night, there'd be a plan in, in this committee to see designs that involve three preschool classrooms and not be aware. Okay. So, Mr. Dunley? So thank you for that update. Um, so it's, um, it helps my comments in knowing that we'll have this on the agenda for the 27th. So maybe you could take back to the committee a couple things. One is, one is that question of, of how preschool is, is, on the, is, is in the scope. Um, I do find that surprising because um, in, in order to properly communicate the scope and deliverable of this committee, I often refer back to the mission statement um, that Mr. Daniels will remember we spent a lot of time <laughs> working on. And it specifically says a K to six elementary school. And so um, I'm having trouble understanding how how the scope could go beyond that. Um, so I guess that would be one question um, that, that I would, I would want to hear an update on. Um, the other is, is just a more general question of how, how's the committee feeling about a uh, timeline of work? Um, you know, what general, not trying to tie people down to an exact date, but just general time frame, what are we looking for in terms of, in terms of an end game? Um, and then I, I was gonna not bring this up until planning, but since it may involve a little deliberation, I'll just bring it up now. Um, I, I have been having some concerns in, in the community about the understanding about what the scope and the deliverable is for, the, for this committee. Um, and I feel like it's, it's the school committee's responsibility to, to clarify that. And it's, it's more than a little confusion, and it's pretty consistent. Um, it's, um, it, it, it kind of comes down to two things. One is that it's a building committee that's going to deliver a building, and that has been asked to deliver a building. And um, knowing all of the hours that our, volunteer, our unpaid volunteers are putting in on this school build, building committee, I don't want to set their expectations, uh, the public's expectations of what the committee is uh, expected to deliver to to deliver to be um, uh, to be setting correctly. You know, so it's I mean it's very clearly a feasibility study to oversee if his feasibility to cost out those options, and so you have to get into low level conversations about size of school and where is this going and you know arrangement. And so you do need to do that in order to get to cost, but it's ultimately a, a fact finding mission that's that's clearly called out in the in the mission statement. Um, and then, you know, the other sort of bit of confusion I, I've, I've encountered is, um, is, is, is the scope. And so, um, 
for example, you know, our, our committee hasn't had one minute of discussion since the end of the past building project in March of 17 about do we want to build on Fort River or not? Do we want K to 6? Do we want grade reconfiguration? Do we want co locate? None of those questions. And if, but we did conclude, and I'm just sort of summarizing from a year ago since so Daniel can clarify, um, is that um, we have the, uh, detailed uh, site and building analysis from Wildwood, but we don't have that level of detailed site analysis feasibility work at the Fort River site. And so whatever happens in the future, we want that information going forward. And so that was the reason for asking the town meeting to authorize the, the money and, and setting up the committee. And so I kind of feel like we almost made a mistake in the naming of the committee because it's called the Fort River Building Committee. <laughs> and it's not. It's not, okay, it's, not, it's not technically? It's called the Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee. Okay, then, then maybe a, another, so I don't mean to add to your list, Dr. Morris, of no, items no. to... No, no, this is, this, this, this is mm -hmm. how it's um, supposed to work. Yes. But I, I, I find that that's, uh, and so I'm not online right now, but I think at the AmherstMA.gov yep. webpage, it is called the... I'm on it right now. The, the Building Committee. Yeah. And so when I think about... I made, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. Deming, just interrupt, but I, I made a, a very... Uh, multiple points about this particular point a year ago when this committee was first being formed that it needed to be named, we need to be crystal clear that this is a Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee because we were not going to be recommending a building. We were recommending, we were working on a feasibility study that would have some low-level designs. Right. That's absolutely 100% right. true. And, and in addition, so, so that's to set the public's expectations for what the committee is going to deliver, that we're not Expect, but we also need to set the expectations for, for the for, for this committee. So we, we're, like, we're not expecting. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a much higher ask to start from scratch. Look at all of the the district's building and infrastructure needs. Make an educational plan. Decide whether Fort River should be built on or not. What it's like no, we said enough. We just want the information. We, we're not going to have the go into that discussion. I mean, this was like you know after March of 17, um, and we said assume. A new building, uh, and I, to assume a building on KSX um, and, at Fort River, What's, and do a feasibility study on the, the site and the building. Now, you have to get to, into details in order to get to cost analysis, we understand that, but it's about mm -hmm. information, and I, I really, I, I, I feel like we need to sort of level set expectations um, prior to moving forward, so that we so we honor the work of the people who work on that committee, and, 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 um, and do our best to facilitate the, the deliverable to the public. I would completely, 100% agree with what Mr. Dumling has just said, um, and you know I think that it is incredibly important for us to be able to uh, make sure that we're being clear about what the scope and goals were for this feasibility study from day one. When you know when I made the presentation, give from the direction of the committee to town meeting about what we were requesting the funding for. It was very specific. Our language was very specific. We worked on it for a while to make sure that we were identifying what the proposed scope of that was to town meeting. And so, you know, the, this committee, the Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee, was formed specifically to help us answer the question of whether or not we could build on Fort River um, and to what you know extent we could build on there and so yes again to restate what Mr. Dunling just said you know we needed to answer some very basic questions about you know perhaps the size of a building you know uh, what what the site could support um, in order to be able to give us a better understanding of the kind of cost that we might be talking about um, and the scope of, of, a, of a project but it was not to uh, identify an actual building that would, you know, in, incorporate, especially if it's if it's reaching beyond even what the mission of, you know, the, the study was, uh, which certainly did not take into account preschool. Um, you know, I would think that just to go out on a limb, this committee has expressed support multiple times for the importance of preschool, and I don't think that that would be beyond the possibility of a project. But we're not there yet. At this point, we really are just trying to answer some very basic questions, and to incorporate preschool as a question, uh, you know, runs a risk of complicating this project and confusing the community about what we're trying to do here, because people start thinking immediately that we're talking about preschool and we haven't even gotten there yet. We have no idea what's involved there. So, you know, I, I do... Um, 
I, I do think it's important for you, Dr. Morris, to to you know kind of communicate this back to the to the committee uh, to attend the meeting. But I also feel like it, it would be important, perhaps, for before this November twenty seventh meeting, for us to maybe have this on the agenda as a more expanded topic, mm -hmm. um, because so far we've been asking for updates on a regular basis um, about this project and this study, but we haven't really gotten a fleshed out update that includes details like this, and so it kind of begs the question of what other details should we be thinking about and concerned with before we get to the point where something's being presented to us that feels pretty baked, right? And, you know, um, we have a lot of really good people. We have great volunteers. We have, you know, contractors on staff, you know, that have been uh, contracted for this. We don't want to waste people's time. Yeah. And so, can I, might, can I just respond briefly? Um, so. I definitely bring that back. Unfortunately, Mr. Duncan Jim, I won't be there tomorrow night. But I think I, I, I saw a lot of heads nodding. But I just before this agenda topic ends, I know it's late. I just want to make sure I'm representing the committee. Um, so I've heard from the full committee. I, I think it's going to be fine. But I just, particularly as a non-committee member, I just want to be super clear okay. on that topic uh, in terms of the schedule, because I was a, uh, it was a question of the schedule. I'll make sure that I email out there is a, a proposed schedule. The end date for finalizing a report would be March 11th of 2019, um, but it's a pretty well articulated schedule of a timeline and different tasks that are happening. So I'll make sure that it's on the website, but I'll, I'll make sure the link is off to you, um, you know, at some point tomorrow um, that, that has a little more detail than what I'm describing. Ms. Spitzer? Um, so I feel like we've been having really siloed conversations about the capital needs of our district, and I'm wondering if there's a way to, um, yeah, I probably won't be at the 27th meeting. Um, <laughs> I really care about this a lot, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, uh, um, things that I feel like are related to this are the car reform space needs. Mm -hmm. This updates on the Fort River um, feasibility study, and then all of this stuff that's going on at Marlwood right now. Like, oh, oh. To talk about each one of these separately to me feels it's just like we're missing that the, there's this big picture and maybe we had we had a lot of conversations when I wasn't part of this committee about this as a no okay but I, I was thinking <laughs> <laughs> but but is there a way for us to have a conversation about the broad I mean you're going to be creating a capital plan for us but I when I'm looking here and I know we've got the joint capital planning commission meeting coming up or I might be getting a GCPC meeting coming up the town I'm sure we'll hear some of this um, at the four boards. Four, four boards meeting but for me to feel comfortable advocating for and coming up with, you know, understanding well enough whether or not we're making the right choices, I feel like I need to have all of these things put together for me, you know, like, or, or have a form of, of conversation with our entire committee where we can talk about this openly without worrying about whether or not we're um, going off the, you know, the, 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 the agenda. So is that... Um, I don't know. Is that too much for one meeting? I mean, it's also it's a huge can of worms. But I I'm just wondering, like, how should we be having these conversations? Because it'd be nice to be able to do it in a big way rather than just on a school by or on a committee way. And it's not connected to one of Dr. Morris's evaluation calls. <laughs> yeah. Morris. Small, medium, and then maybe Small, long, right? Long, yeah. <laughs> so um, here's the way I think about it, and I'm not trying to answer your question yeah. fully right now. But this is it's my like current <laughs> thinking about it. It's not that it's the answer. So. You know, we had a building project fail last year, and at this point we are in fact-finding mode, right? So we're fact-finding what are the current needs of the current buildings because we know nothing. There's no best-case scenario that involves us being out of any of the buildings anytime super soon. So, like, I think that medium-term capital plan, regardless, like, if we got an MSBA tomorrow, I'd still want to bring a medium-term capital plan because the needs of five or six years, like, I, I think we need, still need to my opinion, request <coughs> significant capital funds. So for me, there's multiple aspects of the fact-finding. One, you know, Mr. Demling talked about regionalization. That could have implications for space and, and infrastructure. We have the 7 through 12. I know it's a regional discussion, but Mr. Demling wisely pointed out that could have an implication for sixth grade. We have this study. So trying to gather all that information, you know, and I know it's not fast enough because it's not fast enough, um, and that's why we have to do this the kind of short and medium term. But I guess my concern is that we have a lot of variables we don't know, and one of the least, not the least of which, is whether the town would entertain, or at least town leaders, 
would entertain or how they would feel about being in an, doing something that's a non-MSBA route. Um, this came up at the last meeting we were in. And so I'm certainly happy to have the larger conversation and maybe it makes sense to flush all these things out. But, you know, my vantage point has been how do we take care of short-term needs? How do we plan for at least five years that we know nothing's happening in terms of replacing, renovating? Um, and then how do we to get gather all this data so that we can then think of realistic options for the larger pieces? And so I haven't articulated that, so that's on me, like until we, you, you, you asked the, a really good question, uh, but how to have that question with the larger community I think is really important to kind of break down what's a short term, what's a medium term, and what are all these ways that we're thinking about the long term possibilities and until sort of some things like March 11th we'll have, I mean we'll get information along the way, but that's going to be like, okay, we have a lot more information about the Fort River site, what it looks like, right, not a recommendation and I get that point and I'll bring that to the group. Regionalization, we'll have some better sense of where we're sitting right in spring, not that we know yay nay, but I think all these things are interrelated and that's what makes it so difficult to, to consider. Sorry, that was really long-winded, but I just wanted okay. to say that you know, uh, I'm looking at this, all these as information that can be gathered, and I think, I imagine at the four town meeting, we'll hear something from the town about capital planning that's long term. Uh, we typically do, and um, I've had active conversations with the town manager about we need that information. We need to hear from the town manager. At least he's not the only person, but we need to hear someone in that role's opinion about <coughs> where are we with the capital projects in the other areas as well as the schools, and um, that's, that's a pretty big, you know, linchpin of how we think about things is where the, how the town feels about that. Sorry, that was really No, long. it's okay. I guess what I'd like is to be in a less reactive position mm -hmm. and a more proactive mm -hmm. position, and I'm not sure how to get there, but what I'm hearing from you is that there's so much information that we're waiting on, but it almost feels like if there is no way to get this done without getting grants, um, then... Or if the cost, like, I feel like we can we can come up with some scenarios and, and doing that planning, maybe that's something more Sean and, and you should be doing, but having, having like three potential, like this is how it's gonna be done if we get a grant for one school, right. this is how it's gonna be done if we get a grant for two schools, this is how it's gonna be done if we never get back on that wait list because it just feels so urgent to me now and I feel like we're waiting for all, of, like there's always just gonna be another thing that an, mm. Another study that we could do, and 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 we've unfortunately, I'm feeling like we're getting to a point in time, especially with this like conversation about the roofs, you know, falling apart. You know, like all of this is just making it feel more urgent, and it's too late tonight to come up with a good plan for it here. But I'd love to have uh, just as a committee, given that it it it's like the, the capital pl budget and the budgeting in general are two things that we actually do have a lot of responsibility on and I'm feeling like I, I haven't we haven't been spending as much time on them as I'd like I guess for mm -hmm. so if we could add it somehow one one recommendation I would have I completely agree with with you and um, you know again I think this is why you know we started this conversation around the superintendent goals and budget yeah. priorities was to be able to incorporate this into that because it is a focus for us on so many different levels so you know I'm looking at the calendar and wondering if maybe the November 5th meeting if that's a good place for us to initiate this conversation, right? And it's to, you know, uh, maybe raise some, you know, uh, sort of hot topics, I guess. It's, you know, the capital planning taking place, it's the regionalization, it's all these different things. And at least, you know, uh, you know, visually and contextually mm -hmm. put it all together so that we can start from there and say like, yes, th these are all the different considerations that we have and let's start attaching some kind of long-range plan. And I do agree with Ms. Spitzer in the, you know, the, the outlining of, uh, you know, how we might approach a planning process like this, you mm -hmm. know, similar to the dual language program. Right? Like if we were to go this route, you know, how do we, you know, you know what would that look like? If right. we go this route, what does that look like? Um, I do think that next week's meeting around, you know, the uh, the, the four boards meeting mm -hmm. is a great opportunity for us to broach this topic, at least publicly, and to, you know, explain uh, some of the things that we are currently considering to the other boards so that they are hearing that from us. Um, and, you know, I think to the extent possible, just to signal that we are very much interested in having the town's assistance 
uh, in this problem because it, you know, it's their, it's partially their problem as well. It's not mm -hmm. just the school committee's problem, and I think we're going to need the town's help to figure out how we prioritize, you know, projects. Um, how do we deal with, you know, all the, the different infrastructure problems that we currently have? But at least in the short term, in terms of our planning, if if that makes sense to you, Dr. Morris, you're, you're nodding your head. Um, if that makes sense to the committee, we look at November 5th as, you know, the way to kickstart this conversation, Mr. Demling. So, yes, I would love to do that. Um, so long as we can separate out the hopefully smaller top side topic of clarifying the scope and deliverables of the Feasibility Study Committee, mm -hmm. um, which I think might be helpful to do prior to the 20, what was it, the 27th, 27th yeah. where... Oh, November 27th. Yeah, November 27th, that, that presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as we sort of scope mm -hmm. that out. Um, I think that would be helpful, and in fact, I think it would be, um, you know, it would, it would be a different thing than what we've typically done, and when I say we, I mean like the school committee writ large of a number of years, which is, you know, when, when you don't, part of not having a plan, some secret plan that we're all marching to, right, um, is, the, is that there are a number of variables right now currently in play, and we've mentioned them all, all, all most of them, your regionalization, six, you know, uh, is, is our statement of interest going to get accepted? That's a big one, right? Uh, this this December January, you know, the feasibility uh, committee. All these variables are at play, and so there's that. And then there's what is our current thinking? So, cause the, to me, I'm finding uh, this is especially true with regionalization planning board and, and some other things, is that a big part of transparency is being honest. That um, yes, there are a number of variables, and we don't know which way they're going to go. But I have a pretty good feeling of how. Uh, of what I would do in this situation. So, you know, and I'll, just, I'll, I'll be very honest, and just to use an example I think everybody can react to is renovation. So we haven't had one second of conversation of should we renovate or not, <coughs> because we've, there's been too many variables, we're not even there yet. Um, I'm personally pretty skeptical about the practical possibility of renovating either Fort River or Wildwood. Because, because Mr. Dunley, I just want to caution yeah. you that that's not on the agenda, okay. and so we, we <laughs> cannot have a conversation about that right. right now. But I but I hear what you're saying, and I think in in the scope of this conversation, uh, moving forward, we can you know we can probably bring back all of these different topics um, and think through you know in a more cohesive way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Is there is there another piece? Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, just to say that there are there are things. Yeah, I, I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, can I make one other comment to sure. Ms. Spitzers? So I do think the capital plan, I think, this year, proposed capital plan that we'll bring, lays out some some pretty significant upgrades we feel like are going to be necessary in the school. So I don't want to minimize it because sometimes capital plans are seen like, and I'm minimizing some of the things we talked about, like the doors that were approved last year. Those are really important. It's a safety risk. I'm not minimizing, but we won't be talking simply about doors, you know, in terms of the next five years in the buildings, you know, and I think the reality is in terms of roofs and some of the big ticket costs, <coughs> you know, we're going to get what we can get out of the current system and we're going to propose even if it's a big ticket item, if we feel like, well, in the next five years it needs to be replaced, we're going to be proposing that it needs to be replaced because that's the reality of our schools. We can't wait forever to replace some of the things that need to get replaced. And some people are going to say it's sunk money, this will work out, the town, but, but we have kids here right now, and that's the way we're viewing it. So I do want to just finish you know, my part of this topic by um, uh, acknowledging your point and referencing that I think things will become more clear when we see all the issues we currently have and how we would potentially approach them over the next five, ten years. Thank you. Okay, um, we are quickly approaching fourth hour of <laughs> this meeting, so I'm hoping that we can wrap this up for, for uh, the sake of our staff and everyone in Amherst Media even, it's been hanging in there. Um, so moving us on to our next agenda item, it's accepting gifts. Um, so we do have, it looks like one gift. And I will take a motion. Um, I may need some help in reading this, but I, I would um, move to accept the gift from gift from the ARPS PGO DG, doing business as doing business as Wildwood PGA number four fifty five to support Wildwood Elementary at the principal's discre discretion in the amount of three thousand two hundred dollars. Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor. Thank you. So it was unanimously approved. Thank you very much to the ARPS PGO. 
and uh, we have these sort of perpetual items on here, the <laughs> multiple policies, which I appreciate. We just keep them on this uh, agenda. Um, I understand the policy subcommittee has not met yet, and so um, we are working on, on getting that moving along. Um, but we will keep this on the agenda until um, the time comes that they address it. So that said, uh, I will take a motion. Can I do, yes, I, and it's very late, I just want to, I know we talked about an email, but I think it's good to say in a public meeting. So uh, for the 22nd, um, the 6 o'clock component will be a joint meeting at Town Hall oh, yeah. in the town, in the town room, that's what it's called, right? In the town room uh, with the select board to hear a report from the Donahue Institute on a study that was completed about the um, cost of students in our district living in tax-exempt housing on the university campus. So we had that as a conversation. We talked mm -hmm. about it a couple of times last year. You saw an executive summary. So that'll be a presentation of the full report. So that'll be 6 to 6.45. 6.45, I imagine we'll have to adjourn and then return back hopefully to here, but Ms. Westmoreland will work on the <laughs> scheduling of spaces for the rest of the meeting. Um, I will say that the agenda that I have looks very long considering we won't be back here till 7 o'clock. So maybe the chair and I will touch yeah. base about what we need to do on the 22nd and what we may be able to push on the 5th because because starting an hour later, I mean, that's not starting, well, it's started, but starting this agenda an hour later, I just want to put that, and there may be an opportunity, I mean, we may want to think about even, you all may want to discuss the report you just received outside the joint meeting as well. I mean, it's possible that you'll have that report. It's 45 minutes, it's a hard stop. Select board has a public hearing starting at 6.45. You all may have more, mm -hmm. may want more time for discussion even when you get back. So. That's a pretty heavy, hefty report, both in terms of uh, importance and length. Um, so I just want to caution us in terms of the rest of the agenda for the 22nd that that will be a significant variable. So you and I can work on that um, a little Absolutely. bit later. Yeah. Ms. Westmoreland? I just wondered if um, Mr. Bachelman had asked about seating for the committee, and I wondered if we might want to bring that up to them and see if they thought. Yeah, do you remember the wording of it? The wording Sorry. was um, whether you would like to be, whether you're comfortable being seated in the audience or whether you'd like a side table beside where this, you know, the slight board has their little individual tables. Um, he said the only benefit for them if you sit in the audience is they won't have to reshuffle in mid-meeting when you guys leave. So, but he said it, they'll completely accommodate you if you want to be sitting with this like I think last year, if I remember correctly, they sort of extended the tables kind of around. You said something about an extension. Yeah, yeah. So, Mr. Dunley? So it's a, it's a joint meeting of the, so it's an open meeting. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we ought to be at the table if it's, if it's our open meeting, yeah. I would agree. I'll let him know. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> Yeah, I was just thinking about the, the long agendas because we just added a pretty meaty topic for the fifth mm -hmm. on top of an already pretty meaty topic. Um, so, and I, it looks like we don't have any meetings in between the 22nd and the 5th, and I know we don't want a lot of meetings, but I also don't think we want to be having a lot, all of our meetings ending at 10.30 or 11. So I just sort of throw that out there of... Yeah, I mean, one thing that I'd actually like to pull off that we'd originally talked about, and I don't want to keep on putting it off, but the special ed program discussion, mm -hmm. you know, I met with some staff. I think there's a desire. I thought we were at, I think I mentioned last time, at a consensus. I think we now need to get back together and have more discussion, which is a good thing, that people feel comfortable saying, hey, I'm in a different place. I slept on it. Um, so I think I'm okay with that coming off for the 22nd because I'm, I'm not sure that our large group can reconvene in time to feel comfortable mm -hmm. with bringing back the 22nd. So um, I think it's, you know, in terms of shrinking agendas, I think that might be able to be pulled. So but why, we don't, can, why don't, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, why don't I Dr. Have Morris and I yeah, yeah. work on that? But that's a great point. We don't want to have these <laughs> exceedingly long. <laughs> we don't want four hour meetings every single time. Um, and, uh, and, and then get back to the committee yeah. on, on agenda items. Yeah, great. sorry enough. about that. Okay. So that said, I will take a motion. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor to adjourn? Excellent. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.